All right, I'm about to go live then. Everybody ready? Here we go. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to the second day, part two of the second Reddit Robotics Showcase. Uh, we are delighted to have our second two categories today, bio-inspired robots, uh, and we're going to see a lot of different quadrupeds and humanoids, which are going to be very cool to look at, and then human-robot interaction later on at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time where, again, we've got a variety of different hands, arms, and other humanoid-esque uh, robots. But now I will hand over to our third keynote speaker, Dr. Matteo Russo, who's going to be talking all about some really, really cool snake robot arms. Uh, Matteo, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thanks only for the introduction. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let me know, please, if you can see the full screen? Yep, we can see it. Yeah, perfect. So hello everyone, my name is Matteo. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And um, I'm going to speak today about snake-like continuum robots for inspection, repair, maintenance, and surgical applications in very tight, narrow, and complex environments. So first of all, I would like to start with a brief introduction on my laboratory to explain why we work on snake-like robots and how we got there. And uh, my group is called the Rolls-Royce University Technology Center in Manufacturing and on Wind Technology. The Rolls-Royce University Technology Centers are, uh, or UTCs in short, uh, it's a network of laboratories funded by Rolls-Royce uh, they're scattered all around the UK and worldwide in like key universities. And each different UTC works on a specific topic of interest for Rolls-Royce. As you might know, Rolls-Royce works mostly in aerospace. They produce uh, almost half of the engines for commercial aircraft, so Airbus and Boeings. Uh, you probably flew like on a plane with a Rolls-Royce engine. And they also do nuclear, especially recently. So uh, our UTC in particular focuses on uh, advanced manufacturing for aerospace materials, nickel and titanium based alloys. Then we work on the fixing and tooling needed for those manufacturing processes. And finally, we work on on-wing robotics. And on-wing robotics is what I'm going to speak about today. And it's basically robots that are made to be operated on wing, which means while the engine is still attached to the wing of the, of the aircraft. So our key application is servicing jet engines. And currently, most of the inspections are carried out manually. You have an operator who goes next to the engine that needs to be inspected. They remove the cover. There's a very small borescope port. And they put this borescope, which is basically a camera at the end of a very long, flexible tube. And manually, they need to like squeeze this borescope in and push it in and out and wiggle it around until they manage to find like the area that they want to inspect. And the environment inside is extremely complex, as you might imagine from the picture on the right. Uh, what this mean from a practical perspective, uh, inspections take a long time and they also require extremely experienced operators because it's not easy to get a borescope to go where you want it to go, like throughout this, in, like in this environment. And also if we find damage, you just need to like disassemble the engine, uh, bring it to a lab and repair it there. And this has massive downtimes and massive costs. So with our robotic systems, we want to perform all these operations automatically. And we're going in this way to, well, reduce downtimes, reduce costs, but also increase the quality. Because just imagine if you can, like, uh, if you can inspect and repair a plane uh, right after it lands, so plane lands and while like passengers are going up and down, you just like put in a robot, go for a full check-in and like you're sure that the plane is going to be fine. Like at the moment, inspections are much more rare and scattered. Uh, what are the challenges? So I mentioned already the extremely complex um, environment. Um, you have to inspect, you might have to inspect any part of the jet engine. So we have the turbine, the compressor, the combustion chamber, and you need a system that's able to navigate around 
the turbine blades and the compressor blades. And if you want to navigate around the blades, you, you need something that's extremely flexible and also that has an extremely small diameter or cross section because often you have a space of like 10 to 20 millimeters maybe inside. And you also have extremely small um, entrance parts, which keep reducing our uh, size, our maximum size. Uh, another big issue is that the target is often several meters into the engine away from our access part. So we not only need something that's extremely small in cross section, but it also needs to be extremely long. So this basically leaves us with a single solution which is snake-like robots. So continuum robots are robots with slender, flexible bodies. Uh, they usually have an incredibly high length to diameter ratio. So you can see robots that are like several meters long with a cross-section diameter that is like 10 to 20 millimeters or even less. And uh, we can fully control the shape of these robots throughout like the intricate channels that you can find in an aircraft and also other complex environments. Uh, at the core of each one of our robots, there's an empty channel so that we can deliver any kind of tools that we might need. Uh, they could be just cameras or ultrasonic sensors for some basic inspections. Uh, they might carry uh, lasers, they might carry drills, for example. Um, the one that you see in the image in the center bottom is a dental drill and any other tool that basically you can fit in their internal channel. And here I'm going to start. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And like there are some other applications, obviously, for this kind of robots. We focus on aerospace, but we've also worked with other similar challenges, uh, which are usually in industrial uh, environment with. Um, that require a long reach throughout complex uh, or tortuous passages. Uh, first example, any kind of pipes. So piping inspection and maintenance, you can find that a lot in nuclear and telecommunications, uh, but also keyhole surgery or any kind of like endoscopy for the human body. And I'm going to show you one of our systems, which uh, has been developed recently. This is a video from last year, and it's just a very short, let's say, trailer for um, a modular snake-like robot that's been designed for medical, um, industrial, and also rescue applications. So I think this system exemplifies a lot what I um, what we try to do. Uh, you can see a lot of our challenges. You can see the environments in which we usually work, so the engines. Uh, and you can see how slender long the system is. This is um, a robot that is over five meter long for a diameter of less than 10 millimeters. We have um, control over eight degrees of freedom. This is actually uh, one of our less redundant robots. Uh, some of the others that you will see throughout the presentation have up to um, 30 degrees of freedom overall. And you can also see how easy this robot is to control. Like we, it can basically be used by a single operator with a joystick. It's very easy to uh, learn how to use it. We have had a surgeon come in and try it, and like he was able to like operate the entire robot in 30 minutes. We had Rolls Royce operators like learning in like 30 minutes, half an, like one hour maybe, how to use this robot inside an R engine. So, uh, what are the features of this kind of robots? Before presenting you our range of snake-like robots for different applications, I'm going to speak a bit about continuum robots in general. And we define continuum robots as continuously bending actuable structures, which means that, first of all, we need um, some kind of flexible elements throughout the body, which is continuous and not scattered, not divided into rigid links and single joints, as you have in normal manipulators. And you need a way of actuating its bending and controlling it. And the most uh, common way of doing this is by using antagonistic mass of elements. Uh, so just imagine the human spine. Uh, imagine the human spine as the backbone of the robot. And imagine having our muscles that allow us to like move our spine around. And that's exactly what we do. We use cables to pull 
different parts of the robot. You can see in the video in the center um, a simple robot with one degree of freedom uh, with two cables that are um, pulled and released in an antagonistic manner and to control its bending. And when we want to control a longer robot, what, what we do is we add more and more cables. And every pair of cables is going to control the bending of the robot up to a certain level, um, like until it stops. And by having these cables stop in a different heights of the robot, you can control the overall shape. Uh, a very similar construction is, uh, uh, well, a very similar actuation is given by flexible rods, which are basically cables, except that they can push and not only pull. And there are also continuum robots with bellows or fluid muscles. You might have seen the Fisto uh, manipulator in the figure already. This is a continuum robot, and it uses these like um, pneumatic chambers along the backbone to control its position, to activate its motion. Uh, this solution in particular is much stronger than our cables, but it's also um, bulkier. So it's really good if you have a shorter manipulator, if you have something that needs to like lift a payload, manipulate, so something that needs to be closer to like uh, conventional industrial robots, but unfortunately doesn't really work well for us uh, with like very tight space constraints. And we also have non-antagonistic elements to actuate our robots, our continuum robots. There are robots, continuum robots that are based on elasticity and pre-curvature of the materials they're made um, of. So for example, when you take continuum, they're called concentric tube continuum robots. Uh, these robots um, have multiple uh, tubes of, um, of usually methanol. It's a nickel titanium alloy, it's an upper elastic material, and you put them inside each other, and these um, tubes are pre curved. So if you hold the tubes one uh, independently, like they, they are curved at a given angle. But when you put a second tube inside the first pre curved tube, uh, the, their overall curvature is going to be the sum of the curvature of the two. So if you rotate these tubes into each other, you're going to be able to control how much they curve and in which direction. And other intrinsic bending capabilities are given by inflating robots. Um, so you could have an, a body that can be fully inflated and can grow, or smart materials, such as shape memory alloys. These last three, as you might have seen, um, enable constructions that are even smaller than the ones that uh, I've shown you with like cable and tendon driven continuum robots, but their accuracy is unfortunately lower and they might not be uh, appropriate for in, um, repair operations, for example, that require a very high accuracy of like, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, or one millimeter. So this is how we actuate the robot. But once we know how we're going to move our backbone, how do we actually, how do we practically? describe that motion and how do we control it. And here we move on to the kinematics. Unfortunately, uh, a standard kinematic model cannot be used for continuum robots. Uh, there are two main approaches uh, to kinematics and control of continuum robots. And the first approach requires modeling with a continuous representation. So we have a continuous curve, which is the backbone of our robot, and we describe it as a mathematical curve. So we're going to use some kind of polynomial or differential notation to describe this entire curve as a single element. Uh, these can be geometrically exact and describe properly what the robot is doing. But unfortunately, these models tend to be very complex, require a lot of like integration and um, differentiation steps. And they might not be suited to real time control or they might just be a bit unwieldy to use in uh, uh, high spec robots. And um, for this reason, there have been a lot of discrete element models that instead try to describe this continuous robot as a succession of rigid bodies or semi rigid components, such as like uh, curves. And this approach basically moves this robot, uh, approximates this robot with incredibly redundant rigid systems. Uh, for which we can, well, we have an approximation error, but at least we can still use a lot of our like rigid robot control methods. Um, and once we are able to model these robots, we can control them. 
with well from a low level um, control perspective a lot of the standard low level control um, techniques and algorithms can be used from a motion planning perspective instead we could do path planning but we have some specific motions that can only be done with like these kind of robots because of the particular features because of their flexibility because of their incredibly high number of degrees of freedom and the first one of them is calling uh, the calling motion can be used, first of all, to reduce the footprint of a robot. So even if we have a robot that's five meters long, uh, in just, just imagine not being able to call the robot and having this robot that's five meters long and you need to carry it around and it's five meters. And if you need to feed it into an engine, you might need a linear slide, a linear actuator that is five meters that pushes, it, pushes the robot from behind. And obviously this is like, Feasible, and for this reason, there are a lot of coiling strategies that allow the robot to like actively coil and control its coiling around any kind of like cylindrical body. And if you put a rotational motor in the center of the drum around which the robot coils, you can uncoil the robot into the workspace directly. This is well not all useful for storing, but also for deploying because it means that you can deploy your robot into very tight spaces. And despite it being deployed in a very tight space, you can still fully autonomously move into a much larger environment. And a second um, motion planning um, technique that is typical of continuum robots is the follow the leader algorithm. And some of you might be familiar with the snake a video game, which is the one that you see in the center, in which you just control a snake that moves around the scheme and like eats things to become longer. So as you can see in the video in the center, um, you don't actually control the shape of the whole snake at all times, but what you do is you decide where the tip goes. And once you've decided where the tip goes, then the rest of the body just follow the motion of the tip. And that is exactly what we do with continuum robots with follow the leader schemes. You, rather than having to control a massive amount of degrees of freedom, 16, 20, 29, 30, or more, what do we do is we take the six degrees of freedom at the tip. We control the active tip and we just remove the redundancy by forcing the rest of the body to move along the tip motion. And this kind of motion is usually used during the deployment of the robot. So when we're going into an area or when we are retracting the robot from an area, we use follow the leader motion. Once we're in position, we tend to uh, lock all the degrees of freedom of the rest of the body and just keep the six degrees of freedom at the tip to be able to just like mm, use standard, like non redundant uh, control techniques and path planning for the operation itself. And the last, uh, I'd say more recent capability of continuum robot is given by circumnotation. And this is a bio-inspired motion capability because circumnotation is a motion mode that's typical of plants that tend to coil to increase their um, overall stiffness. So by coiling, plants are able to lift more load, even if it's just their own, or they're also able to grab, to grasp some environmental feature, like they can, like as you can see here, they just attach themselves onto a net or onto other branches. And by doing so, they significantly increase their payload. And they also um, um, make themselves capable of like climbing or going up uh, areas where they could not have, like that they could not have reached otherwise. And uh, there's a lot of recent, recent effort into making snake-like robots bio-inspired from plants rather than snakes or elephant trunks. And um, uh, there are researchers who have tried to reproduce this circumvention motion in particular with team robots. And well, that was a very quick overview of um, like the main features specific to continuum robots. Now I'm going to present more in depth through our recent robots for industrial, both industrial and medical applications. And I'm going to start with the FLARE project, which was finished in late 2018, early 2019, and was focused on to uh, the coating repair in a engine. So 
the flare robot works in the combustion chamber of an air engine. And here you'll see a short conceptual video that explains, that shows how this works. And I'm going to stop the video to show you some particular features of which I've already spoken about earlier. So first of all, I want to show you the Persco part. Uh, pay attention to where the robot center, like this is what we have and what we actually see from outside. So that's all our access to the engine. And it has very small diameters, less than 20 millimeters, always significantly less than, like often significantly less than 20 millimeters. And then once you have the robot team, the robot needs to navigate around the engine to get to the target point. So here we're working in, sorry. So here we're working in the combustion chamber of the robot. So the navigation is actually easier than when we go throughout the turbine and turbine blades, as you can see here. But one of the challenges is that we need a very narrow diameter, but a very long reach, as I anticipated earlier. So we're working with robots that are almost one meter long. And our second challenge in this task is that we were working on coating repair. And coating repair is done by heating the coating and bringing it to a temperature of like thousands of degrees for a fairly long period of time, 10 to 40 minutes. And this means that whatever is next to our flame, which is carried by a flame spring robot, is going to melt. So this is why you see two different robots entering their engines, because uh, one of the robots is the flame carrier. The other robot has everything else. Uh, they have a spark igniter to start a flame. They have cameras, they have sensors, and everything else we need for the operation, apart from the gas itself. And you can see the two robots reaching the point, finding the damage in the coding, inspecting it, preparing for uh, the operation. And once the surface is ready for the actual repair, the flame spraying robots gets closer and start spraying. So as I said earlier, here you'll see a very, this is just a conceptual video. So you, you see the whole repair done in like five seconds, maybe. The actual procedure is much, much longer. After that, the second robot is going to inspect, check that everything is fine. And Again, you can see the robots going out with a full delivery motion in which you only control the tip and everything else follows the, rest of, follows the rest of the body. And this was the conceptual video. I will now show you a work in progress video that was done in our lab for the navigation part. I can show you the final uh, demonstration for the navigation part because all that we could see was the board score part from outside. So um, I can only show you the navigation from a lab video because we don't have the actual, like an actual engine is not cut into like two different slices basically. And you can see the robot moving in. Um, some things that I would like you to notice, first of all, you can see all these like disks, the vertebrae of the robot. Uh, they are discs in titanium, and they are connected by uh, elastic elements, compliant elements that are made of um, nitinol, so nickel, a nickel titanium alloy, the one that I was mentioning earlier, that's hyperelastic. And this allows for the flexibility throughout the whole body. The entire body has 13 independently controllable sections, and each section has three cables that stop at the end. And you can see the places where the sections stop because there's the slightly thicker or different discs along the backbone. When you see like some kind of like discontinuity along the backbone, that's a place where like you have like cable termination. And yeah, you can see the robot just navigating in. This is the camera robot. And once basically the motion keeps on going like this, once the robot is fully inserted inside the engine, we can have the actual flame frames preparation. So here I'm going to show you a very short video from the final demonstration, which was done in a Trunk 1000 engine, which is one of the largest engines at Rolls Royce. And you can see the actual frame spray, and this is what happened right before. 
in which you can see the second robot, the one with the camera, just like moving next to it and igniting the gas for the spark, which kickstarted in the process. So this system has been fully demonstrated into like uh, an actual engine, and uh, it managed to fully repair the coating of the engine itself. And this was just one of our applications in aerospace. I'm now going to move on to a different application. I don't want to show all the aerospace robots here. And uh, we're going to move to nuclear with our RAIN state. RAIN was, RAIN stands for Robotics and AI in Nuclear. And it was a large research project uh, that uh, was running for the last five years in the UK. It involved more than 10 universities and um, industrial partners, including the cell of even now nuclear plants. And we have also been working with UK AA, which is the UK uh, Atomic Energy Authority. As part of this like large project, we dealt with a lot of different aspects of robotics in nuclear. We were focusing on inspection of r 2 reach areas. So we were working with slick robots for pipes and glove box inspections. And here in this video, you can see a different sync robot from the one you've seen before, which was designed for this kind of operations. Uh, you can notice that it's larger. It's like 15 millimeters in diameter at the tip, up to 20 at the base, because we don't need to enter through the extremely tight parts of um, nuclear engines, of, sorry, airplane engines, but we still need um, um, high flexibility, high mobility. This robot has eight different sections for total 24 cables and an additional degree of freedom at the base to uncoil. Oh, by the way, you can notice uh, at the beginning of the video, you could notice the uncoiling motion. The robot was originally coiled around the drum, and you can see it uncoiling out. And uh, this is just a lab mockup, uh, so there was no defector assembled. You can see here the empty channel in the center through which you can pass cameras or any kind of other sensor or tool that you can need, that you need for the inspection. Um, and yeah, you can see how each section can be independently controlled to look around and operate in different areas. And here you can see um, a coiling operation. And this is one of our uh, mock-up environments, which is a glove box, which is a um, structure uh, in nuclear plants where uh, radioactive waste is usually stored and um, inspected and separated. So uh, these operation, like glove boxes, are usually operated by humans who put their hands into two like holes that you can see here on the left side. There are gloves that protect the human operators, obviously. And they have to currently do the entire like um, uh, process, like the sorting and inspecting this um, radioactive waste manually. And what we were trying to do with Rain was to use robotic manipulators, so standard robotic arms for the main inspection tasks, and our snake robot to check the corners and all the areas, the cans, the corners where like standard manipulators just don't fit. So here you can see the robot inspecting a tight area. And here uh, we were testing a Raman spectroscopy sensor to go inside a can, to check for radioactivity. You can see it here accessing another tight space and moving a bit around. And as I was mentioning before, we tested this robot. Uh, we, we have shown this robot in like the actual environment. We've gone to Sellafield. We brought an exhibition at the Sellafield power plant uh, in uh, the UK. And we've also done several tests into an actual glove box at the UK Atomic Energy Authority uh, main research site in um, a trace, which is close to Oxford in Cullum. And here you can see a different snake-like robot that I will show in more detail later. Collaborating, working with the two robotics arm, uh, two robotic arms that I was mentioning before for glove box inspection. So we had a um, operator 
controlling the robotic arms through an optic device and a second operator uh, driving the well me driving the robot with our joystick from outside and unfortunately um, so you can see that the access of the glove box is fully occupied by the robotic arms so uh, we use one of the features well the flexibility and length of our snake like robot to feed it through ventilation parts and pipes from the side and here you'll see the video from the camera at the tip of the robot very soon. Yeah, here it is. This is what we will see from that robot, which was just an inspection probe. And once the robot gets in into the glove box, it can go into areas where the robotic arms cannot go, for example, into the scan, which has an access part, like an access which is like 20 millimeters. You can see it from outside here in the lower right. And we can also grasp the robot with one of the robotic arms to enable it to reach areas that could not be expected otherwise, such as ventilation parts on top. The robotic arms uh, don't fit. Our robot can't reach it because of gravity. If they work together, we can just like grab the long, flexible, passive part of the robot and use the tip actively to inspect later. And this was our second robot. I'm now going to show you our latest continuum robot, Cobra, which is the one that you briefly seen in the trailer at the beginning. It's five meter long. It's a fully modular design. So it can be uh, designed in for any kind of application um, as it's designed to have an actuation pack, which is independent from the rest of the body. So you can just assemble different flexible tubes onto this universal actuation pack, which contains all the control and computer stuff. And in this way, you can have multiple snakes with multiple different tools for surgery, for aerospace inspection. We have a laser snake. Um, we have different like snakes with different sensors. And you can control the snakes with the actuation pack and with this mechanism, which we call the twist and fit mechanism, which is assembled directly onto the target environment and feeds, pushes the robot in and out and twists it around its axis to help it navigating into the target area. So here you can see the base of the robot with all the cables. This robot in particular has a very long passive body and only uh, 12 cables controlling the deep section for six degrees of freedom at the tip, plus two degrees of freedom in the passive area. And you can see that is, each cable is controlled, is actuated with a pulley and a rotational motor. And you can notice here on the left side of the motor, a load cell, which allows us to measure the tension in the cable uh, so that we can do some force control and also make sure that the cable doesn't snap while we're using the robot. And you can see that changing the robot is very easy. This entire procedure actually takes like 10 to 15 minutes. So we can just bring all the actuators and three, four robots and do different operations in the same day on our target. We can start with an inspection probe. When we find the damage, we move on to repair. So here you see the view from the cameras. We have a stereo camera. Look at these wheels. These are inside the twist and feed mechanism. And they grab the robot and push it in. And you can see an operator controlling everything with a simple joystick. You have the camera view uh, here. You can see, I'm just going back a bit. You can see the robot going through the last part of the twist and feed mechanism and then being fed into the engine. So if you look at the bottom part of the engine, I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, you can see the light up at the tip of the robot entering the engines from the bottom. Then going through, going through a first part, aiming at the second part, passing our second part, so going into the core of the engine rather than the side part, and then navigating around for inspection. You might notice that we use the environment a lot while we navigate with this robot. Uh, the first two robots that you've seen, Flare and uh, Rain, were fully activated, so they were suspended and they could fully function in suspended way, so they didn't need to touch the environment, but that limited their length to approximately one meter. 
this robot is five meter, it will not be able to sustain like five meters of like body just with like 12 cables. So part of it is passive and just uses the environment to guide itself while the tip is active and just by intrinsically like following the leader by directing the tip and pushing the rest in, the rest of the body just like follows. So you can see us going around pretty quickly, finding the top, and then you'll see the tip being controlled with six limbs of freedom to reach the inspection target. And here you can see the twist of the twist and feed mechanism and how we use it to reach our, our target. Yeah, and that is where we wanted to get. We go around and then if we find damage, we just like replace the robot with a repair one and drive there again and perform the repair. So this was the third and last robot I wanted to show to you tonight. Um, well, tonight, this morning, whatever time it is for you. And I have some final remarks. Continuum robots are an incredibly uh, rapidly developing technology. There's a 20% annual growth in publications. Uh, there's a lot of companies picking up this technology, mostly from a surgical perspective. Uh, if you just Google continuum robots or even just soft robotics, uh, soft robots are a sub part of continuum robots. You'll see that a lot of the applications are surgical. But as you can see, it's also extremely promising for industry and a lot of large industrial manufacturers are picking this up for inspection and repair, Rolls-Royce first. Uh, there are still a lot of open challenges. Modeling is one of them. It's extremely difficult to describe, to properly know what's going on in our robots. Uh, most of our models are for the backbone flexibility only, but uh, there's a lot of complexity due to friction, cables being rooted, or other uh, inaccuracies. And this leads to us approximately knowing where the robot is, but not like, but with a very large margin of error. Uh, this leads to a very low accuracy, which makes them not suited yet to uh, perform reliably surgery or repair operations. There's also a need for more sensing and actuation. We need smaller actuators, we need lighter actuators, uh, we need smaller sensors that are accurate and can work in these conditions. So currently we mostly depend on the camera. There's some research on fiber optic to get a shape, to sense the shape of the robot, but it's still uh, a work in progress. So if any of you is interested in any of these topics, uh, we have several open positions which that, deals, uh, that deal with like these challenges. Uh, they are Rolls-Royce sponsored, PhD scholarships. Feel free to check on our website uh, for our opening in the flight. And uh, then I'd like to thank the massive team that has worked on all these robots. We have a large uh, team at the Rolls-Royce UTC just working on robotics. We have our technicians, our collaborators and colleagues at Rolls-Royce, and all our friends and colleagues at the Rain Hub and other industrial partners, Flair, Cobra, and Rain, and obviously our funders, Innovate UK, ATI, and DPSRC. And well, this is also continuum robots. We actually do other things as well. Uh, we have some hexapods, we have some wearable intelligent gloves, we have other inspection robots. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, just check out the website and you'll find everything. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. I was just scrambling to finish writing down a note there um, on the uh, wearable intelligent gloves. I know that in the second session today, we've got um, the Shadow Robot Company who are here to talk about a glove they've made. And um, it'll be interesting to see mm. uh, compare and contrast there. Um, yeah, Michael, what are your thoughts? I've, uh, I've been fortunate enough to see this presentation before, but Michael, uh, so what are your thoughts then? That is some really fantastic stuff. I, I do really like how you guys got a, kind of around the really complex control problem with the follow the leader uh, paradigm. That's really interesting. And I mean, it does everything you need to do and it's really simple. So that seems perfect. Well, um, it's not few... that simple. Not as simple oh, okay. as it seems, but 
uh, okay. because like okay. ideally, ideally, yeah, ideally, you want the rest of the body to follow exactly the tip. But since the cables stop at different heights, sometimes you cannot bend the body exactly around the same shape. So there is a certain like displacement, and you need to minimize these error, like the errors, to avoid like scratching the engine or like touching other parts. Well, uh, is, it, is it really, really critical to not, you know, make contact with the engine while you're in there? For us, not really, but other applications, especially surgical ones, might say otherwise. Okay, yeah, cool. I guess, yeah, you can, you can bump in, if you're moving slow enough, you can bump into it, you're, only gonna, you're not going to leave anything more than the tiniest little scratch if you're moving nice and slow. Um, but we've got a lot of questions. Uh, I'm going to be sneaky to ask one before, just because I know it's one that um, me and a few of my colleagues and the people I know work continuing arms and any anything involving wire, which for me is normally kind of a, um, I have an aversion to using cables in robotics because, you know, they can come with lots of challenges. One thing for me is a big thing is spooling. And if you get the wire to wind up and release, you're always going to get some differences in the way, you know, how do you can kind of control that particular problem, which for me, I've seen in the past is a very consistent source of errors that are very hard to diagnose or control. Um, so anything on wire spooling? Uh, wire spooling, you can try to control the spooling. You will create channels in the spool that actually guide the wire. There's always going to be some backlash involved. So you're going to have some errors and I fully agree on cables not being an ideal solution. But unfortunately, our issue is that we don't really have alternatives because we have something that needs to be, I don't know, eight millimeters in diameter. And we want an internal diameter of six millimeters. So we have like one millimeter left and you cannot really build a, like put a DC motor there or something on board. No, so I it's think, basically- I fully, Yeah, I fully agree with the cables in this scenario. Um, I think until we can find some kind of yeah. solid state actuators that are purely, you know, electromagnetic or something like that, or fully move into artificial muscle, it's going to be, which is again, wires essentially. Um, anyway, right, Michael, um, uh, would you mind start pitching yeah. some of the questions? You got it. So one of our uh, viewers asked, you know, do I understand it correctly that the robot is connected to a fixed base, which then controls the actuator wires? So there's always going to be some part of the robot that is outside of the operating environment. Yes, that is correct. Most of the continuum manipulators that you see around always have a fixed base because, well, you need to have wires going somewhere. You need um, your actuators to be somewhere and you need the fixed reference. Mm -hmm. There are some snake-like robots without fixed bases, uh, and those kind of robots tend to focus on uh, individual, like independent locomotion rather than manipulation. But for manipulation purposes, you'll basically always see robots with bases. OK. Um, some of these questions, I think, did get answered later on in the presentation. Um, so someone's curious if the navigation is pre-planned at all, or if there's some level of decision-making or like SLAM required uh, if the environment isn't perfectly defined. So um, depends on the application. Obviously, when you're working in an R engine, one of the advantages is that we have the CAD model of the R engine, so we know exactly what's inside it and the exact geometry of everything. Uh, we have a camera, you can potentially do slam, you can do autonomous motion. Um, the interesting thing is that our operators and partners usually don't want autonomous motion. So whenever we've spoken uh, uh, to both like surgeons and Rolls-Royce operators and other technicians, uh, they always want an operation. Uh, so what, okay. and that is also the reason why uh, most of the robots, our robots that you've seen work on teleoperation, like Cobra, the last one, you could see like there was an operator controlling it at all times. It's not because you can't use it automatically. Flare was mostly automatic, for example, but it's because most of the users actually prefer having a direct control over it and uh, more direct feedback. We're also working on implementing haptics into our continuum robots. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, soft robotics and smart materials, but these all seem to be cable-driven robots. Can you talk about the decision there 
and uh, what would have to change for the other types to be viable? Well, they are all viable, basically. It just depends on your application. Soft robotics is much better in tolerant structured environments, and especially when you don't know what's going on. And it's more flexible, but less accurate. For most of our operations, we need to maintain a certain level of accuracy. So we prefer a cable-driven system, which still has a lot of rigid elements for which we can define sort of like precisely the shape, the position. So it's a bit of a trade-off. You can go softer and softer, but lose accuracy or like harder and stiffer and you gain accuracy, but you tend to lose flexibility. So it's just a matter of like what you're looking for. Okay. Um, I have a personal question about that is, um, so what what kind of payload can the end of the you know arm support the end of the the, the robot support you talked about using cameras and you know even like a a flame kind of thing at the end you know is there any opportunity for putting some kind of grasping device on there and being able to pick things up move them around or is that entirely outside the scope of this project? We have worked with whippers, not within the project that you've seen, but in others. Uh, you can, well, as you've seen, both Flare and Rain were able to sustain like the end effector load, which is approximately 100 grams. Uh, we have a robot that's mm -hmm. able to lift another additional 200 grams. Uh, obviously, okay. the payload depends on how long you want your robot to be, because the longer the robot, the less the payload. Got it. All you got anything? Uh, yes. Um... Sorry, I was looking through some some old materials there. Um, uh, so at the moment, these are very much for the you know the one-off applications, and it's still not not a prototype stage. It's definitely there that you know the industry quality level. Um, how what kind of time span do you see for this becoming something where we do see it replacing people out? You know, and obviously it's a difficult prediction to make. But anything you can give away for that? So it is still a difficult prediction, but most of our robots have been actually been pushed to technology readiness level six. I don't know if you, if any of you knows like TRL, but like, which means that like it has been fully tested into the real, like into real case scenarios. We have two different prototypes that go to that level. We have a third one that's going to get there like pretty soon, which means that um, if everything goes well in this plan, we might see some of these technologies like on the market within the next 10 years at least for industrial applications medical applications yeah. that might take longer because like there are additional like safety requirements and challenges yeah you, you it, i mean you're still you're still going to get in trouble for scratching up the inside of a jet engine but it won't be quite the same lawsuit as yeah. the inside of a person um and, and then um i i guess as we you know uh, go towards like the robot octopuses and things like that. For, for how how you know will that kind of technology scale well once you have that first version? If you wanted to then try and say okay, we want to actually manufacture these not on a one by one basis. How how well do you see that kind of translating? You know, can all those individual parts just be churned out on a machine, or would it be something where there's still going to be a lot of tailored work involved? Well. Uh... From a manufacturing point of view, our systems are not complex at all. Like they require precision manufacturing. They are expensive to make. They require very high precision manufacturing. Like we have walls, like some of the discs have walls that are like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeters thin. And like most of the robots that you've seen are in titanium. So like obviously like there, there's like high costs involved, but like if you go on to slightly larger scales, like 15, 20 millimeters, for example, the robot, you, we have 3D printed most of the body. So it's not that difficult to manufacture. The, I'd say the most painful part is actually assembly, because having to like route all the cables throughout the body and fix them, that's that's very like time expensive. So there's, so there's a market out there uh, for those watching for a robot that can assemble um, ten, uh, continuum robots. If you can, if yeah. you have some robot that can like wiring. automatically, yeah, 
rule the wires in and like maybe prepare the wires. Yes, there's a mark like combine it now, combine it now. Yeah, interesting. Um, any any more questions uh, from the audience? Uh, no. I, yeah, again, this is something where I've I've seen this presentation before and I still enjoy it. I, you know, there's enough detail where I pick up new things each time. Um, uh, and so the partnership with Rolls, how long does the partnership with Rolls Royce and Martin go back then? And is, uh, you know, you've got these existing projects, but then, you know, is there a plans for the future or are they entirely focused on just jet engine this task or do they have, I, don't, well, I think Rolls Royce have mentioned before, they, they don't really care how they save money, whether it's robotics or otherwise, they just are determined to save money on the cost of jet engines. Well, we, we were like our um, laboratory, the UTC was funded in 1999. So that's when we started the collaboration with Rolls-Royce. Like we were funded as the Rolls-Royce UTC. And we are probably the, the luckiest UTC around the world because we are the ones that that's closest to Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce is in Derby, we're in Nottingham. They're like 15 minutes away from us. So we, we do collaborate with, like we work with them a lot we see them like they come to our lab like weekly uh, we see them very often all our like researchers PhD, all our phd students have an industrial supervisor as well from rolls royce so we just work together on everything we are involved um, in a lot of discussions on like the future of like research both for rolls royce and for us and we tend to decide these things together so we, we are like very well embedded into <laughs> And integrated with their like research process. I'm not sure if I answered to your question fully. Did I miss anything? Um, you're muted. Um, Oli, Oli, you're muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, no, and uh, obviously I'm not payer endorsed in any way, but I've heard uh, I've heard very good things from the people who have worked at Rolls Royce. I think they've got a pretty good reputation for not just paying and treating people well, but also making sure they've got good career progression and they can work through uh, quite fast uh, in the careers that they want to pursue. Um, wonderful, right, Michael? Any any last thoughts, or we could take a a few minutes break and then return on the hour for our next presentation. That sounds good to me. So I say thank you again, Matteo. This was a wonderful presentation. Really cool stuff. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, and thank you for taking the time to present. Well, thank you guys for inviting me. Wonderful. Of course. Right. I will spotlight myself. Uh, and then we will see you again uh, in just under 10 minutes on the hour for our next presentation by Colin McKenzie, Humanoid Hexapod and Legged Robot Control, all free. Um, uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, see you shortly.
Right, uh, just so you know, we are live uh, still. Um, uh, looking forward to uh, the next presentation. And yes, a lot of comments about various uh, sci-fi from uh, Continuum Robots, Dr. Octopus and um, Cthulhu and uh, many other robot uh, arms. Hope I didn't go too technical. That's are, right. we, uh, are we live right now? We are live at the moment. Yeah. You said yes or no? We've got a couple, yeah, we are currently live um, on YouTube. We've got a couple of minutes before um, the hour. Um, oh man, did I ever have some issues? My computer decided uh, it was going to start blocking off the heat. Well, that's what it's meant know. to do. And that's yeah. what it's going to do two minutes before the presentation, isn't it? Um, exactly. Well, 30 minutes before, luckily I had time to reboot. And, uh, One thing not like. Yeah. Okay. One thing I thought of, Michael, I think um, we need to uh, do a little 3D printed model of I gave a live demonstration that then people who uh, have successfully given a live demonstration can download for themselves at home to say, I gave like a that. live demonstration of robot. That's right. If you make it through on skates, you deserve a little trophy. Yeah, no, I, um, I've seen that done for a few other remote conferences. That'd be super cool. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be fun. A little trophy or something, or a plaque. Okay, well, we are, we'll move on, and away. it's only quite a, a short slot, I'm happy to give you an extra minute, so Colin, if you are ready. I'm all set. Wonderful, we will hand over to our next presentation then, Humanoid Hexpod and Legged Robot Control by Colin McKenzie. Take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, today I was going to show off what I've been working on for the last few years. Uh, specifically with legged robots, um, hex pods, uh, uh, for example. Uh, uh, these are ROS modules, uh, but they can be configured for any number of legs uh, or arms. And we'll compare it kind of to the Move It 2 project, which exists on ROS now. So Move It 2, as we know, it's for industrial arms, for pick and place, welding, that sort of thing. Uh, but it doesn't deal with legged robots really at all. Uh, and this is something I found in Ross in general. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of examples of legged robots. I mean, there are some, but they're they're always bespoke uh, programs. They may use Ross too as a communication backend, but there's nothing that you can just kind of pick up, do a legged robot, and, and run with it. Uh, although I, I am seeing more of it, the robot dogs lately. So just hope yeah. So the project that I Created is called Robot Dynamics. Uh, it has another name called Robot Control, but it's specifically for the robots. Still works for arms too, but it's not for the industrial side of things. You can do humanoids, hexapods, robot dogs, and you kind of biomimetics with appendages. Now, in terms of dependencies, it's very similar to Movic 2. So you've got the Oracos uh, KDL, which is the dynamics library, does your inverse and forward kinematics, and uh, inverse dynamics, uh, which is your forces and torques. Uh, they both rely on the ROS, ROS uh, controls project, so as long as your servos or motors, you know, will work within the ROS controls framework, then it will work with, uh, with robot dynamics. Uh, they, I also use the point cloud library because sometimes I have to read the mesh in in order to get some information on it, specifically ground contact and so on. And it also still works in tandem with your on your new ROS2 drivers, your ROS localization, your path training. And it doesn't replace, say, for example, model, model predictive control. So it's not the actual controlling of the robot itself. You're still going to write a user control program, but it's going to save you all of that you know, processing of sensor information, determining the robot state, uh, and you know, how it's orientated in the world, and that sort of thing. And specifically, I mean, all the things that this project creates as output would be perfect as input for your model predictive control. Uh, so robot dynamics, robot control, so, you know, as I already mentioned, it integrates robot state from your sensors, uh, estimates the robot state in the environment or orientation, um, and both in acceleration, velocity, and position, 
uh, using more broad specialization, estimates internal and external torque forces on your joints, uh, and then manages your limb genetic factors. So instead of dealing with segments and joints within the user control program, you can deal specifically in, you can deal specifically with uh, just limb genetic factors, like saying, you know, I want my hand here, I want to be able to move my hand in this position. All that other stuff, you know, within the arm and inverse kinematics is done for you. Uh, or, you know, you can take an arm, for example, convert it to a leg. You know, so you can go from a bipedal robot to a quadrupedal robot, which I've always found cool from the Red Planet movie, you know, that Amy robot. I mean, it went nuts, but it was neat. It could walk on two legs, and then it had this dog mode that it could switch to. So we should be able to switch, you know, uh, the limbs and end effectors in at one time and be able to change how they get uh, uh, how they get incorporated into the control strategy. So all of the configuration really is in your your EF and your SF EF file, which I'm sure a lot of people are already familiar with. So all of your physics, your 3D uh, description, your segments and joints, they're all within the your EF file. And then in your semantic file, you can include some other information like uh, you know, being able to group legs and arms together, or being able to group other end effectors together into you know, saying that these these two form your bottom legs, these two form your upper arms, or you can then convert it over into being your front legs. Uh, now, URDF is complex to mark up, unfortunately, but kind of the way it has to go. The SRDF is much easier. Uh, but once you have all that in information in there, there's not a whole lot of configuration inside of the robot dynamics. It's both relying on the URDF SRDF stuff, which is just standardized, and it's also relying on the ROS2 configuration, which, you know, so it doesn't have to go in there and configure your servo, for example. It's all right. that information is already there. Uh, so internal sensing or your proprioception, in other words, you know, where are my joints and segments in, uh, relative to my body? Um, that stuff is easy. I mean, you can pull that right out of your servos, you've got physical position feedback, and you've got your motor torque, which is, or your motor current, which is directly proportional to your torque forces. So that's that stuff's pretty simple. Uh, the inverse kinematic is provided by the TF2 topic, uh, which is usually done in Robot State Publisher, which is a simple mode, but Robot Dynamics has to do that anyway, so it can take over that job. Robot State Publisher and more. And it provides you more information, such as the dynamic forces, your torques, and so on. Uh, but your external sensing, this is where things get really complicated. I mean, you've got figuring out your robot poses, easy, but where are you in the world? You know, you hook up an IMU and you've got acceleration, but you don't have velocity. I mean, if, if the robot is falling, technically you don't, I mean, yeah, you do this gravity, I guess, but if you're if it's going down the highway, it has no idea if it's going zero kilometers an hour or a hundred. Um, and so you need you need to figure that out through a lot of like uh, you know, a lot of information that kind of goes in layers and it's it's dependencies depend on the sensory information you port and it just it kind of errors compound. Uh, but this is where robot dynamics is trying to figure out all this stuff your center of mass, center of pressure, uh, your support polygons, and whether the robot's in balance. All right, so let's look at our first video. We've got sensing the external environment. Uh, so here we're looking at RVs2 and uh, usual robot uh, visualization, but there's some added information here. So you look starting at the feet, you see uh, some brush hangs around the feet, and that is. Robot dynamics figuring out whether those feet are in contact or not. And it's not even using foot sensors, it's actually just using external forces and phones to determine uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's standing on solid ground or not. The uh, center green ball is the support ball. So if it's green, that means that the robot is standing within its support polygon. If it's red, it means it's out of balance. And here, I'm, I'm not, it's not even, the motors are not even working right now. I'm actually just picking up the robot and moving it around by hand. So that I can you know, put it into different modes to see how that balance works. So, all right, so look at the, for example, we were talking about ground contact. How do you know your feet in contact with the floor? I mean, 
I wanted to do it in a way that you didn't have to use sensors, you know, like you didn't have a force torque pass or something at the resistor pass at the, at the bottom of the feet, which would be perfect. But, you know, if you, you know, the IMU has a gravity vector, so you know whether, you know, where the gravity is. And with that, you can figure out, you know, you have your robot pause, you can pose, you can figure out how gravity is affecting each of the joints. And you can even figure out, you know, is the ground pushing up on the feet? Or is the feet pulling down on the hips? If the feet is pulling down on the hips, you're falling. If the floor is pushing up on the feet, those vectors reverse, so you can figure out whether that leg is on the ground or not. But it's not perfect. Uh, and you still have to deal with friction, and you know, Ross and Argus doesn't have any functionality in terms of so, so that's all built into that robot thing. Like that's Colin, I hate to interrupt you, but yeah. just to say you've got two minutes left, so I'd suggest if there's any oh, more videos yeah. you'd like to show, now's the time to just go for it. Okay. Uh, well, let's look at compliance. So the other, with all this information, I've tried to do, for example, compliance. So here, the robot is actually, the motors are engaged, and I'm just moving the robot around by hand, and the robot's responding to my forces, so sensing, sensing the external forces and adjusting. Uh, in this case, it's using the IMU, so as I'm moving the body around, it's actually using the compass in the IMU to, uh, to keep its, its feet nailed to the floor. Uh, this was a big part to figure out how to keep those legs in one spot. Uh, have... So here, um, so you can use... I'm going to fast forward to some of these videos, but within the RVs, you can activate these manipulators, manual manipulators, six, six axis, and you can then pick up uh, a leg and be able to uh, have the robot respond to that in real time. So here I'm translating that leg back and forth, and it's hovering just you know a centimeter off the floor. Uh, and then there's a trajectory building to be able to record more points and then play them back. Similarly, on the humanoid uh, manipulation here, uh, as, you, as I'm moving that arm, you can see the balance is adjusting. Uh, so the balance algorithm is responding to my manual input. Okay, Colin, I hate to cut you off here, but we're out of time. Okay. Um, and All right. So, uh, no, no, there's no need to apologize. Can I make a suggestion? We've had quite a lot. We've had a few people suggesting there's issues with the audio, which I can appreciate. So if you, there is also, however, a cancel slot um, at 11:25 EDT Eastern. So that means that after the next presentation, there'll be a few more minutes if we want to uh, chat and come back to ask a couple more questions. In the meantime, okay. um, I will say. Uh, um, audio issues aside, this is a really impressive piece of work. Anyone who's tried to. Uh, control arms of any kind in ROS will know the pain and this looks like a very elegant solution so I suggest anyone who's got Milento ROS mm -hmm. to check out the GitHub link and uh, if you have a look, work on your microphone we might be able to come back uh, later on to ask a couple of questions but for now we will move on to our next presentation if that's okay. Okay, was, was my audio bad? Uh, yes, Michael, if you could chat yeah, about the that. The microphone was a little, little stopped. Yeah, Michael, if you could chat with him in, uh, via comments, um, we'll just move on to the next presentation. Um, but thank, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, and yeah, it does look, I really suggest people check out the, um, uh, the GitHub link um, and have a look at some of the examples there and find a bit more about it. Um, and the YouTube channel too, I'll put the YouTube channel link in there as well. Um, we'll move on now to our next presentation, Design of a Modular Quadruped Robot Dog by, uh, please correct me if I'm not pronouncing this correctly, uh, Halid. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Wonderful. It's nice to get it right. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to present my project on this platform. Uh, today I am uh, present my, as uh, Oliver said, a quadruped robotic vehicle, which a uh, changeable capacity and capabilities. Uh, which uh, with um, give it still uh, before I start this project, I define my objectives of my robot, uh, and these objectives are uh, to make stable and sustainable uh, for 
any types of work for my trajectory and a modular approach to make quick access uh, quick and easy access for changing abilities and sensor to overcome complex work uh, robot has some default components uh, on its own that components are uh, computing in it that control all the servers and the, the modules uh, battery units that provide energy to all the modules and uh, uh, power regulator units that regulate power from the uh, battery units to all uh, power uh, required parts and a uh, remote controller units that which uh, control all the modules and the robot itself. On the other external uh, modules, uh, this prototype has right now a uh, LiDAR module, drone station module, and dangerous gas detection sensor module. Uh, similar projects uh, like mine have different approach uh, to this uh, robotic framework and likewise Cheetah and uh, Arat Robotics and Open Dog, uh, James Bruton's Open Dog V2, more likely a research project. But in other uh, hands, Spot Dog, the Boston Dynamics Spot Dog, uh, is a product that's already on market and uh, have a capable uh, have a capacity of doing uh, most of the job uh, right now at my project uh, only one module can be uh, uh, sorry uh, at other projects only one uh, module can be installed and capacity will be limited uh, to abilities of this specific module uh, but at my project multiple modules can be plugged in at the same time on any slots uh, of the main body of the robot. Instead of building different uh, robots for every specific task, we will use one robot to uh, do many operations with combinations of uh, these modules. Uh, this module approach has many advantages, like my uh, useless way, we can get, get rid of useless weight. Uh, and limited battery energy will not be wasted unnecessarily, budget friendly, and it in case of breaking or upgrading any parts, uh, you can easily access the components of the robot. About the chassis, I designed all the uh, 3D models on the Fusion 360 and 3D print all the parts on my uh, ANET A8 printer with PLA plastic. I uh, specially focus to make it strong uh, and light as possible to make a frame. Uh, while I designed the bottom layer, I plan to transmit uh, all the data and power uh, from this line. Uh, and the main battery unit has two LiPo batteries and 15 minutes usage capacity with uh, a 7.4 volt. And the secondary uh, battery unit has also two battery, a LiPo battery and 10 minutes usage, usage capacity. Uh, on other main uh, modules, the regulator unit, as I said, uh, regulate the power from the battery unit and uh, distribute this uh, voltage to uh, modules and the servos. Computing unit has TNZ 3.5 microcontroller, control all the modules uh, and the Wi-Fi and uh, servos by itself. And the computing unit has GPS uh, and gyroscope as well. Remote controller 
has a unique design for this project. We can control all the changeable settings uh, and functions with, with the switches and the menu interface. We can control all the motions with uh, its two three axis joysticks uh, and accessible uh, with this device and also its display receive the data from the modules. All the external modules uh, and the remote controller have their own software coded on Arduino. Uh, and as you can see, all of them have a flowchart and this project also uh, open source on my GitHub channel. There are two movement functions currently. First one is walking, that steps are balanced and uh, fast. That's called trot style walking. And if uh, you want, you can modify it by step, it st steps by size or timing. And secondary is standing. Note that you can move its body any direction on the three axis rotationally, rotational or uh, linearly. I used uh, kinematics and inverse kinematics to drive all the four legs that I wrote myself this formula. Uh, and these formulas are all used in walking and uh, standing mode. Also, robots have uh, three autonomous capabilities that uh, Keep balance on third surfaces with gyro unit, uh, accelerometer sensor, uh, and height adjustment, height adjustment uh, under pressure and overhead obstacles with extra lidar sensor. Uh, on extra modules, the, the lidar sensor has a uh, infrared distance sensor on top of a DC motor. And it has 360 uh, rotation capacity to weave all around. Uh, dangerous gas detection module has a MQ-7 uh, gas sensor that uh, currently detects carbon monoxide and the methane gases. If uh, read it values above the critical level for human health, it informs by genetic an alarm or uh, and uh, display uh, alert on a remote control. And last external module is uh, drone station module. Uh, on this prototype, my uh, drone station module doesn't have a uh, flying drone, but potentially it can be have one. Uh, my main purpose is to have station which contain, contains a drone. It's, and when driver wants to fly it, drone, uh, Expand from the case and unfolds, and it can be controlled with the same controller as well. Uh, at this point, my project finalized these results, and uh, it has pretty modular Unix design and softwares and uh, various sensor, uh, modules and sensors with work skills uh, and four difference or different module, especially with innovator uh, drone module. Extra module can be added by other users or third party. And uh, yeah, it can be upgradable. Uh, and yeah, it can be used on uh, various work with same robot with bunch of uh, other module, uh, I, I think. And mostly this project mostly is a prototype and on this scale uh, for my project, it limited to uh, more soft work on and uh, right now it's just like a uh, toy bot on the theory, it can do various modular things. Yeah, thanks for listening to my presentation. If there's a question about my project, I'm I'll be glad to answer all of. Uh, yeah. Uh, would you mind um uh stopping sharing the screen then? Um, yeah. Uh, so I thought that was 
Uh, absolutely amazing. I really, really like the quadruped, and a lot of the people in the comments are saying that as well. Um, it's really cool. Can I ask, is this a project, you know, you by yourself or as part of a team? And also, how long did this take? Uh, I did all the planning and the 3D modeling and electronics by myself, and uh, it's my the high school project uh, for uh, some tech uh, contest. Uh, it takes about a six month from finish to start with debugging all all, all sorts of things. Uh, and yeah, uh, on full the work on this project, I work alone, and usually I take my resources on internet and GitHub and various. Uh, likely projects on internet yeah well i have to say that is absolutely amazing i, I really get yeah, really is an incredible achievement and there's there's so much of uh, you know that has gone into it and i've seen a lot of people you know uh above above your age and with more experience attempting to build quadrupeds and having a much harder time of it uh than you have and there's a lot of you know very good design choices about the chassis and the way you 3d printed it and the i do like the modular boxes um yeah. let alone the ability the fact that mm -hmm. and you know what i can totally see how close that drone is to being able to rise out and fly yeah, it. and it's yeah. absolutely fantastic the fact that it has its own little deployment really is impressive thank you thank you uh, I, uh, I try to uh, build the drone uh, on this uh, time scale, but uh, for my uh, perspective, I didn't know uh, a lot of drones and uh, things with uh, drone motors and a API things. Uh, so I need to skip the drone thing uh, for for this yeah. for this time. Yeah. Well, we have time uh, for, yeah, worry um, about that. Wonderful. Sorry, Michael, go ahead. Oh, yeah, we have time for just one quick question from the uh, YouTube channel. I know we're um, running out, but uh, Chris asks, you know, it's a pretty impressive suite of abilities. You know, did you develop each individual module that you're putting on there, or did you, like, design this platform to use commercially available tools? Um, also, how easy would it be for someone unrelated to the project to make their own module and, and just, like, add it to the robot? Uh, right now, I not uh, hard work to API of the module and interface with uh, those, but uh, for this kind of work, you can uh, easily implement the uh, easy modularity to this project. Uh, and I, for the first question, yeah, I built all the modules by myself for this project, uh, especially lighter module, uh, and not as uh, uh, not give the quality as the on the market lighter, but uh, it's done the job for. Uh, giving the 360 uh, distance from object to uh, its own. And the, yeah, I think that's all. OK, well, again, uh, just to reiterate, you know, again, to, to reiterate what, again, has been said in the comments here, you don't need to worry about the fact it might not be as good as the professional version. What you have built in six months is absolutely incredible. And the, the quality of the... Yeah of the details in the presentation as well and the it's you know it shows that to build something that good you also need to be good at planning and building excel spreadsheets and things like that too because you know that's what it takes to do it right so you really should be uh, proud of yourself that's an amazing job um, thank you thank you absolutely yeah. as i understand our next uh, presentation has can is cancelled so we have until uh, 11 35 or 35 past the hour wherever you are in the world so uh Assuming that um, uh, Colin has his camera, uh, sorry, his headset working, we can take a couple, if you want to uh, just uh, 
show a couple yeah. more videos or something like yeah. that. Sure. Uh, how do I sound now? Is that much better? Much better. There we are. Nice. It's, it's much better. Zoom so, decided to Zoom decided to use the microphone on uh, on my RoboCam here <laughs> instead of my headset. So <laughs> I was just unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, I just first want to say, Halid, that was amazing. From one uh, leg guy to another, that's uh, very impressed with that robot. You should be very proud. Thank, thank you, thank you. Well, Colin, uh, so we do have one question from the, sure. uh, the YouTube comments that we didn't get to during your time slot, but um, what hardware are, are you using on the robot itself? You know, what edge device are you using to kind of run yeah. this stuff on the robot? So I'm using uh, our Pi 4, uh, and it's overall, like, I still have a lot of CPU left. Uh, there's a couple percentage CPU usage while it's running at about uh, 100 hertz, so. Uh, lots of processing space left. And then I, you know, when I'm developing, I develop on my desktop. And of course, Ross lets me, you know, internet work that so I can, I can write nodes on the desktop and have it still communicating and controlling the robot. Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, if you have any more, you know, videos or any more topics you like to talk about, please go, go on ahead. Uh, so I was showing the video of it actually walking, so this is the state of where it is right now. Um, and so I'm controlling it with a, a small remote control, uh, uh, the transmitter. Um, there was, uh, yeah. I know it's kind of recorded on a potato cam, but so it's not really the best video quality, but. Uh, and it could go a lot faster. I have the speed turned way down because as I'm developing, I, I don't really want it to go wild. Sometimes as I'm coding and I get a bug, it, it will go pretty bad. I've got some pretty good bloopers. I mean, here, here I'm back in Arvis here and I'm just visualizing the trajectories and you can see it's not going so well on those ones. Sometimes it's just not, not mapping quite right. I, you know, hopping up and down like a monkey, you know. Uh, it sometimes it just kind of flies away. Uh, I've also, I mean, in simulation, same thing. I tried to simulate it to try to protect, keep these robots from being harmed, but uh, simulation didn't really go so well either. I mean, gazebo just seems really difficult to get the physics configured right. You know, this is where it started. I mean, it's like break dancing. Uh, then, so you get that working, and then it's doing the splits. And then it's doing this rotating thing. And I, and Gazebo, I don't understand, like, how is gravity not present right now? Like, how is that not falling? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, say what you will, it's pretty great for a, a blooper reel. <laughs> yeah, that's about what it's good for, I think. I mean, like, I don't know, it's, it's not, it's floating away. Like, I can simulate water, I guess. Uh, and then so I switch to a different engine, and then I get this. You know, actually, that's not bad. I mean, that that's like a power, you know. Yeah, like, it is. You know, it is at least, you know, how the physics would you know, behave with, in some sense. Yeah, if it if the joints weren't loose, then, yeah, that's that was actually pretty decent. But then to get it to actually work with the joints, I couldn't get that to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up using uh, machine learning to tune the parameters because you got this, like, KD and KP and dampening and all these spring things, and you're like, what are the values of these? And there's no documentation as to yeah. what the ranges should be. You know, it's, well, it's really difficult to get set up. I mean, do you have any machine learning for that on the a device itself, or is the machine learning just on the kind of simulation phase, and then you take those parameters and put them on the robot? Right. So the, I mean, this, these were these parameters that I was tuning through. I was using Hyperopt, which is a Python library, and uh, those. Uh, though that was purely just to tune the simulator it had nothing even to do with the robot so and oh, uh, so when you get the, the robot actually running it's not even using you know those kind of physics parameters it was just to get because the values were like well what, what should kp be well 50 to 50 thousand <laughs> which one like can you give me a hand here no it, you yeah. just got to kind of trial and error and yeah. i'm like well no <laughs> uh, absolutely the idea yeah, was and one it, of those things that really gave me a, a really big dose of imposter syndrome when 
you know, you, you do it as part of an undergraduate course and it feels like you can kind of do it. And then you do it in an actual application. You realize they've taken the bumper lanes off the bowling alley and now you're just hitting the gutter. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, this uh, is, yeah, we've got a couple minutes more. So this is a, a really, really good, powerful package then. as it's Because I'm looking at the, the GitHub for it and there's there's... There's the um, the folders, but there's obviously not a lot in the readme that gives me much more information about it. So if I want to start using this for myself, and I think there's a chance I might, how would I then go about getting, um, you know, replicating on my uh, my robots of what I was working on? Yeah, uh, you know, I wish that this was completely, you know, ready for the for public use, but you know, there are still some issues being ironed out. I mean, I've got things walking and so on. And I'd love to have somebody that would that would want it, to use it and, you know, and, and help in that regard. So for anyone who is, you know, is up for a challenge and would like to also help out bring this to the state where, where it's really like move it to, which is ready, uh, then, uh, yeah, get in contact with me. I, uh, I would love to have some, some help and, and get some more robots working with it. One yeah. thing, uh, well, before we move on to the next speaker, and thank you very much, Colin. One thing that me and Michael ha were discussing yesterday, I think, is it'd be nice to add a page to the website where people can get a list of all of the open source projects or projects that um, people are looking for collaborators, and that can be directly there. Yeah, um, yeah, it does. It needs a, a lot page. Of people yeah. who are doing very similar things, and I've been thinking, oh, this person should talk to that person. They might have some help there. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 If you know anybody, then please send them my way. You have my contact right. information. Yeah. So. I'd Rob say for our community on, on Reddit, you know, I, I'd probably estimate that we have the most legged robotics. That's the thing that most people are interested in. So I, I, I bet you'll be able to find some people that are interested in making it easier for themselves as well as contributing to this project. So I, I, absolutely on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, well thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much, Colin. Um, and so we'll move on now to our next presentation. And uh, speaking of quadrupeds, this is one that has uh, done well to get quite a bit of traction on the um, subreddit itself over quite a few months. Uh, I've been following it on YouTube and I won't, you know, hype them up anymore. I'll just let them speak for themselves. Um, Jacob here to present the Honey Badger Quadruped, which I think is a good name for a uh, robot dog uh, as they go. So Jacob, take it away. And thank you. I will share my screen and uh, do you see the presentation? Yep. Uh, okay. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jakub Bartoszak. I'm a robotics engineer and co-founder of Mab Robotics. Uh, in today's presentation, I will tell you about the Honey Badger Legged Robot. Uh, designed, especially designed for inspection and maintenance tasks in the underground environment. I'll start from Mab Robotics history and I'll introduce the company. Then I'll tell you a little bit our, our previous prototypes, uh, quadruped robots, and of course about the Honey Badger robot in detail. I'm super excited that uh, I can give the presentation here. Thanks for having me. So without any further ado, uh, let's begin. Uh, in the beginning, there was a group of three students of mechatronics engineering, myself, Łukasz, and another Jakub. We enrolled in a scientific club at Poznań University of, of Technology. Our main activity there was designing the six-legged robots. Uh, with the robot, we participated in many robotics competition around the world, where we won some awards, even two bronze medals, during a robot challenge competition in uh, Beijing, Beijing, China. That was great motivation to work even harder. Uh, this is our first robot. On the left, you can see the first steps uh, of the robot. And uh, on the right, uh, how it looks like after many upgrades. At the time, we were really big on robotics and robots development, but uh, with no clear idea how we, we uh, were to use them. Uh, but meetings with few people change a lot, uh, game changers. 
First, we met Krzysztof Wallas, professor of robotics, and he introduced us to overall problems in the industry and told us about the strong need for new types of robots. Second, at one robotics event, we meet people who work in the underground inspection industry. They invited us to see what inspection and maintenance of heating networks look like. And I need to tell you that it was far from ideal. As you can see, the heating network tunnel has two pipes inside. But between those pipes, there is some free space where the robot should move a record and record a video. Uh, but Willet platform had a lot of problems with traversing rough terrain. Even small obstacles caused a lot of problems. So we introduced the solution, Legged Robots. In order to build the most situated solution for inspection and maintenance works inside those types of networks, in 2019, we established the company, Map Robotics. During this process, we received support from the academic business incubator at Poznan University of Technology. Uh, uh, we got a small grant uh, from there and started work to commercialize the idea. A year later, we got our first financial round from venture capital. And then development on higher level began. In 2021, we participated in two programs for startups, KPT and Incredibles. As a result, we got business know-how, business partner, and next funding. There are 10 people at Map Robotics today. I, Łukasz, and Jakub here, uh, are here from the beginning. Uh, there is also Krzysztof. While at the uni, he was our engineering thesis advisor. Uh, and now is our mentor and scientific advisor. He helps us a lot. Uh, the rest of the team joined later so that now there are five more engineers and an office coordinator. We maintain strong relations with our alma mater, previously mentioned Poznan University of Technology. With our robust team and ties with the PUT so strong, we are ready to eager to embrace any challenge. Okay, have done the intro. Let's move closer to the gears of the game. Uh, I'll tell you about our technology development history, how we got from our engineering thesis to the Honey Butter robot. Uh, before we got uh, there, we created four robot prototypes, and the fifth is being prepared. First prototype was built within the frames of our engineering thesis. It was pretty unique due to application of direct drive as robotic actuators. We applied standard drone motors and developed a pantograph leg structure. A great amount of work was on motor controller development. We did it ourselves because controllers available on the market were too big and heavy and, let's face it, too expensive for us. We implemented impedance control mode to the controllers, so each actuator was like a mechanical spring. The controller gets the target position, spring rate, rate, rate and, damp and damping factor. Uh, the robot was a great achievement for us, but it would only operate in uh, the lab conditions. Uh, the second prototype was built in 2019, thanks to a grant from Poznan University of Technology. The biggest difference between this and the first version is the mechanical structure. The robot has the same name, uh, number of freedom degrees, but leg has greater reach and performance. Inside the sealed and 3D printed robot cor corpus is a place for actuators and electronics. So everything is in a safe place and ready to be tested in hard, harsh conditions. We conducted a few tests to verify the potential of the technology. The biggest disadvantage was poor quality parts due to a lack of funding and under development of electronics, which causes a lot of technical issues during operation. Regardless, there was also a highlight, namely controllers, that allow us to control and measure the torque, which we use to estimate the force which the robot press on the ground. 
the measurement accuracy was around one Newton. This is enough to recognize the friction coefficient or even ground material. If you take a look at the slide, you will see the comparison of force estimation and force measurements by the additional sensor on the, on the Z axis. Uh, we, we, have using, uh, we have been using this solution in each robot since then. Okay, the third prototype. It was built after we, have, we had got the first investment round from venture capital. At that moment, our team started to grow and we were able to create much more adv advanced technology. We started from a universal and easy to modify platform. The goal was to prepare the components and software which might be used in the next versions. Also, we introduce one additional degree of freedom for each leg. Before that, our robots moved like a tank, but after this change, robots are more agile. Uh, the actuators which we used in the third version were quasi-direct drive. It means inside each actuator module, there is a brushless motor, our MD80 motor controller with integrated encoder, and a planetary gear with low reduction ratio. The planetary gear significantly improves torque density, which allows us to create heavier robots. A small reduction ratio like uh, one to six doesn't negatively impact the dynamics abilities of the and force accuracy measurements uh, of the robot. Currently, we use uh, from shelf T motor actuators and we integrate them with our electronics. Uh, on the occasion of uh, third robots version creation, we decided to develop a power management system dedicated to mobile robotics. It worked out great. The board controls the current flow for each robot module. We know what the battery charge level is and we can remotely restart computers. As a rule of thumb, a battery power supply isn't perfect for research in the lab. Normally, we should change batteries or a robot is useless while charging. But the power board allow us to work without brakes. This is because the board is able to switch uh, over two power sources without power cuts. So we can use two batteries and exchange them uh, while the other uh, one is being charged. Uh, we can also use a laboratory power supply and work without brakes, but with a wire in that case. Uh, a significant part of the job during the third prototype development was uh, dedicated to software. We designed the robot system based on ROS2. This approach uh, gives us the possibility to independently develop different modules and to easily integrate everything at the end of the day. Furthermore, we created the physical simulation for our platform where everything might be tested before the first run on the real robot. I believe that because of it, we avoided several robot damages and saved a lot of time. On the right, you can see the robot with an MPC-based controller on a slippery ground. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is our fourth prototype named the Honey Badger. Uh, it was built at the beginning of this year. This is the first platform that worked without money issues and allows us to show the robot outside, outside our hub. The electronics are inside water and dust case. The robot is controlled wirelessly. The battery inside the robot allows us uh, to 45 minutes of walking, and we can easily put the additional battery at the, on the back of the robot uh, and uh, double it. Yeah. Uh, the robot mass is about 10 kilograms. Uh, the speed during stop, stable walking uh, is one meter per second, but we are working on improving this. We tested 2.5 half meter per second, but the walk was highly unstable. Uh, we developed our, and implemented our own MPC-based uh, controller. It is still a work in progress, but the results are promising. Robots can walk pretty stable, yeah, pretty fast. Uh, 
uh, you might ask what is inside the robot corpus. Electronics are most delicate, so we put them inside a waterproof and rugged body. There are, there are the battery and electronics modules for power management. There are also two compu computers, one for locomotion and the second one for additional, additional sensors like depth cameras and higher level tasks like path planning. Plus, it contains an EMU sensor and communication module as well. Uh, the corp has a button to run the robot and a few connectors to charge the robot uh, and plug additional devices. Uh, the robot can lift extra equipment. It hands easily with two kilograms extra weight. Uh, we run tests to check if the robot's vibration during walking affected uh, the sensor data quality. As you can see, the LIDAR, LIDAR data was accurate enough to let us prepare a 3D model of our office. We are testing thermal and RGB cameras too. And uh, for example, we can colorize the model with the temperature, which is especially speci useful uh, during heating network uh, inspection. In the future, this setup will be minimized and we will use it to model uh, underground networks. Currently, we are at the stage where we conduct a lot of tests in real conditions to confirm the advantages of the technology. We are still working on better locomotion on various types of ground and recovery functions after falls or breaks. If everything goes well, we will improve the inspection system and we will start with the first inspection services next year. In the video, you can see the robot with camera and light module in the industrial real, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the robot isn't completely waterproof yet, uh, but we have an IP67 actuator prototype ready. It was successfully tested uh, by one week, uh, constant operation 1.5 meter uh, underwater. So in the next couple of months, we will produce 12 actuators like this, and the whole robot will be completely watertight. Uh, I, oh, sorry. Uh, it might be interesting for you to hear about our spin-off technology as well. As I mentioned during the first prototype description, we have developed our own brushless motors controller. Uh, to do so, we have acquired complementary motor control knowledge. Since then, one of MAP Robotics' source of income has been providing our or developing uh, motor controllers for other projects. Our controllers are used in wheeled platforms, other legged robots, cooperation robotic arms, and bipedal and humanoid robots. They are even being tested for use in airplanes. If you are interested, check out our website uh, for more info, video exam exams on our YouTube channel and documentation of, on our GitHub repo. Uh, I encourage you to follow our LinkedIn or Twitter profile. We keep posting interesting photos and videos on a regular basis. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I'd be pleased to answer and discuss more. Thank you. So again, uh, just like last year, the quadruped category is uh, certainly one where we're seeing, you know, the most impressive robots, and it's a very popular topic at the moment. This is an incredible quadruped. Um, yeah. Uh, I've just been doing a little bit of Googling in the website. I think it's a reasonable assumption to say that this is the best quadruped in Poland. It's probably the best quadruped east of Germany. Like, it's amazing, amazing stuff. Really, really Thanks. cool. And to see the company uh, this gone from 2015 so you know only a short four years and to make so much progress so quickly to get through some iterations as well and to you know often there's uh, something that i've known as referred to as engineers arrogance which is the idea that just because you've got a, a phd in electronics that you would think you're qualified to run a business and it's a whole different set of skills 
Yeah. But you guys have, you know, seemingly done a very, very good well at building up the company and handling your media and your networking and securing funding, most of all, because that's always such a tricky task. Um, so I guess I would, if I'm, I'm going to start with a question there, what was it like securing funding um, for your for your startup company? Was that something that was easier because you were you know, new and you were the only person in town sort of thing? Or was it a long up road to convince people to invest in such a small company? Uh, yeah, that was really hard for us. The hardest thing in the in the project was funding acquiring because uh, when we was on the, uh, when we ha had only a prototype, uh, and especially that one which wasn't look like an uh, industrial robot, people don't like to talk uh, about business with uh, young people with something which looks like a toy. Yeah, uh, so uh, that was pretty hard because of it. Uh, but thanks to... Uh, a few our friends and uh, hard work uh, yeah we we m make connections with venture capital and uh, m prepare business model and everything uh, yeah and now uh, now we, we still have fundings from venture capital but uh, we are profitable and we we can uh, we, we we are selling our products and uh, and yeah, we we we, have, we are constantly uh, have funding. And large, you, know, you say profitable. Does is that um, coming from selling the the motor controllers and the motor units, or is that coming from working with other companies and doing development for them more? Uh, it's it's coming from selling uh, uh, motor controller uh, controllers. Yeah, uh, and also for preparing projects robotics projects for other companies like uh, we developed a robotic arm for agriculture or uh, uh, electronics module for other robots like for uh, disinfection disinfection robots for covid so we have we have all great engineers in the company so yeah we are able to do almost anything yeah yeah, I'm looking at. I I want one. Um, I don't have a budget for it right now, but I want one. Um, Michael, um, over to you. Any questions? Yeah, so we've got a few questions from the uh, YouTube stream. So someone noticed that you are using Nvidia Jetson hardware. Uh, do you have any plans to integrate the Nvidia Isaac SDK into your existing ROS two system for simulation? Uh, yeah, uh, we, we we are using. Uh... Mujoko simulator right now, and uh, I think it looks uh, uh, it works well for now. But in the future, when we start working with AI and, and uh, 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 do more tasks with that direction, I feel I think it it will be great to also use uh, Nvidia uh, simulator. Yeah. Okay. Um, and another question. So you developed your own motion control. What advantage does this give you over like an off-the-shelf kind of model? Uh, I don't know if there are any ah a con a motor controllers. Yes, uh, from oh, all yes, the yes. Sorry, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, uh, so when we started our project, there was two products which are uh, ready to use in walking robots. Nowadays, there is few more on the market, but five years ago, we found only two. And uh, the, the rest all, uh, also, also then was other, but were significantly too big or heavy. But those two are uh, significantly uh, too expensive for us. Uh, yeah, we, we have budget like 20% uh, of cost of uh, one controller for 
uh, the robot. So, uh, and we have, uh, we had a lot of time and uh, uh, we were eager to, to work. So we developed our own solution. Yeah, I, I think uh, you can buy something similar on the, on the market nowadays. Uh, but uh, if you have your own technology and everything which you have in the product is your own, you have uh, a lot of advantages uh, on the market. Uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if, if you can do it in house and you can, you know, yeah. keep up with all the the technical debt that's required to maintain your own um, hardware and software, then there's advantages to it. Um, yeah. Exactly. And and with where the industry is at right now. The, the fun thing about quadrupeds is, quadrupeds is we are kind of in the Wild West days where there's still plenty of room for creative ideas and innovation. And so lots of people are going with their own ideas for it. Um, yeah, very cool. So, so you mentioned your primary target application is for this thermal inspection in pipes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah yes uh, exactly this is our first uh, first area of work because there are a lot of problems and we have we, we have contact we have been in contact with few companies who which are looking for uh, the best solution for inspection those networks and uh, our robots should be great for for this task and this is uh, the beginning in the future uh, we will uh, still uh, uh, prepare robots for other places too and uh, develop other robots. Yeah, but this is the beginning and I, I think this is a great, great market without, uh, uh, yeah, we have quadruped competitions right now uh, in that area. Yeah, yeah, I can say, yeah. Often with the, the startup companies that we're seeing, they're, they're, they're focusing on a very specific customer as their starting point where they've got a, almost a one-to-one -one relationship with their, their source of income to get the product or service off the ground. Um, yes. Yeah. Very impressive. Um, Thank you. Uh, Michael, any, any, any more questions from you? Um, let's see. None from the YouTube. Uh, I guess just want to say thank you for presenting. This is really wonderful. And uh, you guys are doing some really, really cool stuff. So yeah, excited yeah. to see where it goes. Really, yeah, really, really is impressive. Um, and and I, I guess, you know, I, I'm not in the category, but I guess if people want to find out more about the company, they can check out the website I put in the link. And uh, I guess based on the success that you'll be hiring at some point in the near future. So if you're someone out there looking for a job at a quadruped company in um, Poland, keep an eye on them. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, if I, if I were trying to go for a quadruped company right now, this would be high on my list. Absolutely. Um, thank uh, you very much. And yeah, wish you all the best in uh, your future quadruped endeavors. I uh, hope to hear more from you guys in the future as well. Um, keep sharing the wonderful work on the subreddit. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And that was a pleasure to, uh, to show the presentation. Thank you. Bye. Likewise. Wonderful. Uh, so we can go then uh, four minutes early um, over to uh, our next presentation, the first of two humanoids, both of which are built from the same competition, uh, which is wonderful because they uh, you can do a nice compare and contrast then, I guess. Um, so it's very much a friendly competition I've seen from the, from the Discord server that everyone who is part of the RoboCup competition is often uh, very much looking to help each other out. So... Uh, they can tell us more about themselves. I will hand over to uh, Lutz Freitag of uh, RFC Berlin. Hey, yeah, uh, that's me, I guess. Hey, um, <laughs> um, I, um, it's actually the old first RFC Berlin because we need to have a pun on binary numbers. Let me just uh, share my screen to presentation. Can you see the presentation? We've got you. <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, we are the old first of C Berlin. We do robot football because robot football is, I do not need to explain this, right? Um, <clears throat> we are, um, wait, in robot football, there are just different categories and there's a humanoid platform as well. There are multiple humanoid platforms. 
uh, leagues and uh, one of the leagues is like a kid size. This is what we compete in. Um, technically, we, we the, uh, the members of the RFC Berlin are uh, uh, veterans of another robot football team at our university, one of the universities in Berlin, Freie University Berlin, that we had a team called the Fumanoids. Eventually, this, this team got discontinued and we thought, well, it's a, too good of a hobby to have, right? So we just funded our own robot football club. This is the RFC and to my knowledge, we are the only robot football club which is not associated to any university. So this is we have a website with a horribly outdated blog. We also have a, well, on Reddit, we have a logo. And yeah, anyways, this is our motivation, robot football. There's not much more I need to say about robot and why robots are great to have as a hobby. In our case, a hobby, not at university or any, I don't have any professional background in robotics to that extent, right? So we do robots for fun. And since we are from Berlin, Berlin has the reputation of being uh, sexy, but cheap and broke. Um, this, we cannot really afford uh, actuators, as in the previous presentation, right? Ex actuators are insanely expensive. And with the humanoids, we had the funding from the university, but now we don't have any more, obviously. So we need to roll as cheaply as possible. And yeah, we would pay over 9,000 euros if we would build the robots that, would, that we had in mind with off-the-shelf actuators. So kind of one of the key features of our robot, this is Mickey, by the way, is uh, most of the electronics is uh, custom made and this enables us to get the actuators as cheaply as possible. And if we would have rolled with uh, the stock parts, we wouldn't have a fallen entire team. But we ideally you have five robots per team, four robots would be on the pitch, and one can break, like one robot for the gods. Um, and it would be out nearly 50k just for one team of robots. This is unaffordable to us. So anyways, we made our own robot. And since we, if you make your own robot, you can just think of it like, as you like, right? The rules dictate we cannot go higher than one meter, so we went for one meter. Um, the rules don't say much about the wine, actually. We have, there's a BMI equivalent where you have to be in a region, a valid region. Um, we are, right, that's fine. Um, however, most robots in RoboCup actually have 20 actuators, 20, 20 servo motors, which are spread on a fairly repetitive pattern across the, the body. But some, some robots have parallel kinematics in knees and stuff, but this is like the main the major difference. Um, I mean, well, when you make your own robot, you can just do whatever you like. And uh, here I went for 30 actuators. I actually wanted to have 32. I wanted to have molds in the wrist just for the lulls, but um, didn't at the end because there was no, not enough space and I was too lazy. You get the idea. But um, I wanted to have uh, non trivial joints in the road, like proper ball joints or something that comes as close as possible to ball joints, like in the, in the neck. Mickey has like five degrees of freedom in the neck, five motors in the neck. Actually, like two. Four additional passive joints in the neck as well. Those this mechanics are kind of spread across the entire robot. So I have also a lumbar joint which resembles a ball joint, and um, in the feet, the ankle joints are ball joints as well. I mentioned those because those are indirectly driven. You can kind of see on the the Pokemon card on the right that um, in the lumbar joint there's some push rods. This is how the lumbar joint is actually actuated. Same thing in the lower neck, same thing in the upper neck and the ankles. This is what makes those pad 10 passive joints. Um, this is a close up of the neck. You can see how it's uh, actually working. As you can see, we use the absolute cheapest actuators for the lower neck because they do not need to drive a lot of mass. That's perfectly fine. The lower neck itself has stronger servo motors. Um, those are, those used to be off the shelf RC motors with like 30 kilogram centimeters. Uh, it's like nominally uh, three newton meters of uh, torque um, where we removed the internal electronics and made our own electronics uh, around it. i get to this a bit more. This is like the electrical part of the robot. Um, fundamentally, this is our setup. It's fairly straightforward. We have a host computer. Um, probably in our robot, we will have a Odroid N2 plus, probably. Probably. Um, this is connected by USB to the power control board. This is something like this, self-made. 
here is where the batteries are. Um, and then we have a RS-485 bus uh, based bus communicating to the rest of the robot. So it has a very, very timing critical protocol, but it allows us to do a lot of IO to the, to the motors. Anyways, this is the power supply board. Very straightforward. You have uh, batteries, lithium ion batteries going in there. We opted for lithium ion batteries because those are the batteries you can find all over the globe. If you happen to go to a competition in any other country you have to fly to, and at the airport they remove your batteries because sometimes this is what people do, um, you do need to get new batteries on site, and you can get those from like any power tool battery pack. Just open it up. I don't do this at home like this. They call it be dangerous, but if you know what you're doing, just open it up and then remove the batteries and you're good to go. Use those. Um, it also has audio, which is kind of nice. So if I uh, power cycle the, the board, it has audio. It's great for feedback. So when battery runs low, you get another sound. Um, when you turn on the motors, you get sound. You can turn them off. And yeah, we have a hand animation. We have colored LEDs. Super important. Um, yeah, I mentioned before we have uh, our motor controller boards as well because we need to cut costs, and this is the point where we can cut costs the most by getting rid of the expensive uh, server motors. So um, those are custom-made PCBs. They can control six motors easily. Like we have one microcontroller driving six motors, which is kind of neat because we have six motors in each leg. So we have one of those boards in each upper leg. And while well, they're hooked to six, six motors, one control loop to rule them all, uh, they can communicate over RS-485, which is a robot bus. And they also have a USB port, which is super handy. I wish more boards had this, like more boards in the hobbyist robotics community thing, because um, uh, configuring those boards over USB is so damn convenient. Um, the name itself is a German pun. This is hard to get, but it is there. And one special thing about how our boards work, our motor controllers work, is um, they have different semantics, as you would uh, expect from server controllers. Usually, you just tell uh, your controller to go to a certain value, to a certain angle, with a certain velocity. In our case, we use polynomials. So we, have, we communicate a polynomial down, take the polynomial of rank 2 over time, and then it just applies the polynomial, which is kind of neat, because the control loop can sample the polynomial at whatever frequency it runs at, in our case 40k, kilohertz, and do proper estimation, which also means that you can calculate the velocity at each point when it samples it, and the acceleration as well. Feed this in a glorified PID controller, then a PID controller with another derivative term for the second derivative. And anyways, the math behind it is super simple because it generalizes a lot. That's, that's kind of neat. Uh, they also have, have a, an IMU board as well. It's called IMU board. Um, it implements a external common filter running at one kilohertz because this is the frequency we get data from the sensor itself. One neat thing about the bus we have is um, since it communicates over USB to the host computer, we use an isochronous uh, endpoint between the gateway board, the before board, and the host computer to uh, communicate batches of data that come that are read automatically from the microcontroller. And this is paced at one kilohertz by the USB standard. So we can schedule stuff at one kilohertz rate anyways. And as it happens, this is also the frequency, the sensors operating. And we can actually move live data, live raw data from the IMUs all over the robot to the main computer. Like if you were to implement a Kalman filter on IMUs, getting all the data that's available on your host computer so you can prototype with Python things worth gold. This is kind of how it looks like on the oscilloscope. If you were to look at all the data going on the, um, the bus, like one division, one horizontal division is one millisecond. This is when our board automatically fetches the data. Um, given us having 30 motors, we effectively have like 35 bytes of bandwidth per motor per millisecond. This kind of neat because they communicate six bytes of current uh, information about the current state, like position, velocity, current, type to them. And then we communicate uh, three shorts down as well, which is like the polynomial. And we can easily fit this into the, the bandwidth available, which is super neat. 
which I have to rush through this because I only have 10 minutes. So very, very dumbed down overview of the software. C++ all C++ 20, yay. Uh, all Linux, no surprise there. No ROS because, yes, because, I don't know. We are feeling better with uh, software that we we created, and thus we know all the nitty gritty details of it. This is kind of kind of the answer to the question that happened last the last talk about why make your own controlled software because you know it well. I guess that will be my answer. I say on the same note, like uh, my baby, and this my biggest baby in this project is like the inverse kinematics solver. Which works also with loopy kinematics, like those push rods in the neck and the lumbar joint and so on. So I can, in terms of inverse kinematics, I can just tell the passive joint anywhere to have a certain angle or the axles, axes have a certain direction. And the inverse kinematics all would then figure out how to articulate the push rods. And also with velocities and accelerations, and you can just toss in a somewhat arbitrary function in task space. You press the weight function. You have the home, home button. Yes. So the wife, <laughs> I have a beautiful assistant sitting there helping me out. Thank you. Um, this wife function um, is actually consisting of, of a set of uh, points, which are then fed into spline generators. So at t equals zero, the hand should be here. Then the t equals one somewhere else, and then it resembles a wave, a uh, waving motion. Um, anyway, since I have a polynomial interpolation, I can, at each point in time, uh, calculate the position of the target position of the hand, as well as the velocity, as well as the acceleration. And this is then transformed into what our actuators can understand, which means polynomials for each actuator. And the neat thing about it is, as I said, I have this control loop running on the actuator boards at for whatever high frequency. and uh, I have a different uh, rate at which the motion planner and the host control software operates in. Right? And the scheme with the polynomials lets us uh, actually decrease the rate at which the motion planner operates to very, very low frequencies. I have a robot dog down there, and I can, I can operate it at like 30 hertz motion planning rate without seeing a decrease in the performance of the motion. That's kind of neat. Um, yeah, I've reached the end of my presentation. <laughs> About time. <laughs> I am open to questions. Sorry for, for me rushing through this so badly. No, no, no. I think that was good timing. Um, oh, great. You actually put on the speaker of my head. <laughs> You're coming up there. No, uh, that, was, that was really, really good. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoy, I want to get involved in RoboCup and, you know, towards the end of my PhD yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but in the meantime, it's wonderful to follow all the robots because you can see that so many different approaches to the same kinds of problems and the way different teams are going about it, uh, not just in the technical and the design and the software, but also the strategy. And um, there is a good trade-off to be had for saying ROS or no ROS. Um, I know a good example of um, a friend of mine who wrote a kinematic solver for a ARM in C++ and it ran about 16 times faster just because it was the written solution rather than um, going through all the abstraction that a ROS package would have. Um, uh, uh, everyone obviously is talking about how much they love the hair. Um, <laughs> uh, change the oh, change the can, you can you bring the camera a little closer? Can we get a close up maybe? I hope so. Wait for it. Uh, does this work? It just yeah, yeah, we can see um, it. You can see it. Oh, that's fantastic. I can also I have a color picker. I cannot use the color picker. Uh, you can change the color. Anyways, yeah, this is um, transparent TPU. This is um, pretty pretty filament. It's a fairly cheap solution. And below below it, like below each hair, there's an RGB LED, and they can be controlled individually. And I guess you can turn it off for compliance with the rules in competition then? Um, the rules are not exactly clear about it. Actually, they are not even clear about whether the hair contributes to the height of the robot. If it would, then our robot couldn't quite compete. Or we could just remove it, right? It's not you could remove it. I was thinking about um, 
I know that for uh, my understanding is that the rules require the robots have to be made of a black material for you know ease of being able to spot them visually. So that might be um, something. Not entirely, thankfully. Not entirely. We can uh, some parts of the robot actually purple because it's a great color. This is our team's color. Um, purple would not be okay. It would be too close to red. And some team markers when you have the robots playing against one another are red. And if you are playing not in red, which means blue in this case, and you have some body parts. Uh, resembling red, then it's easy for the robots to confuse uh, ro other robots. Um, just one thing about the Ross thing. I don't want to rant about Ross, actually. Um, I think the, the most important reason why we don't use it is um, competition, right? There must be more software out there than just Ross. Everybody is using Ross. But I think it's not the best software, and there needs to be more variety. So I don't, well, I don't think, I, my understanding is the people who develop ROS don't think it's the best software. That's why they've made ROS 2. Um, and it's always an ongoing battle. Try, you know, you'll, you'll never uh, achieve perfection so long as it's in the distance. Um, I am really looking forward to the next speaker because they just migrated to ROS 2. And well, just now was the World Cup in, Ro in football and they went to, uh, to Bangkok. We didn't because we only have one robot. And, I mean, can't really stand at the moment, that's why it's sitting. Um, I mean, it's, it's certainly the big challenge. Um, my university used to have a robot football team, and the big challenge there was um, in the the large technical debt you get with maintaining code over many years, and especially if it's involving university students, uh, maintaining good code uh, ain't easy. It's not easy. So certainly there's, there's pros and cons to having to take on all that work yourself. Um, Actually, one of the design features of our design goals of our framework we use is uh, code should be as easy to remove as possible, including the framework itself. This is like proper code when you're done right. It's easy and it's painless to get rid of. If you can do it right, you can do it right. Um, uh, certainly, it's a hard challenge, and I you know, admire it. And like to, it, you know, look forward to seeing it in competition and all those good things. We'll move over to our next speaker now. The next. Uh, Robo Cup humanoid uh, football team, also from Germany, uh, the Hamburg Bitbots. Yes, uh, and they'll be telling us about their humanoid. Uh, so you really get a great example here, folks, of compare and contrast as a um, Mickey waves goodbye. All right, uh, can you hear me? Actually, yes, we can. Take Perfect. A um, you unfortunately won't be able to see me because uh, I had some issues earlier with my uh, technology. But um, yeah, we are from the Hamburg Bitbots. Um, we are also participating in the Robo Cup in the same league as Lutz and the RFC Berlin do as well. Um, we're doing things slightly differently. You'll see that in my talk. Um, first off, um, yeah, what is Robo Cup? I think most of you guys know, so I'll go really quick over it. Uh, it's a research competition. We're playing soccer against uh, other robots. Um, the image you see here is from this year's competition. These are all the robots that were participating in our league. Um, with the goal to, by 2050, beat the human soccer world champion uh, in a fair match uh, with the team only consisting of humanoid robots. Um, yeah, why soccer? I mean, it's something everyone knows a bit, uh, everyone is familiar with. So. That's uh, probably a good idea to get started with something everyone else knows, but it's still very complex for robots. Um, just to give you a quick idea of what gameplay looks like at the current state, um, we're still quite far from actually getting uh, to our set goal, but we're getting there and we're doing uh, fundamental research in all areas of robotics, so that's pretty cool too. Um, this uh, is our team. Uh, I'm the one at the far left on the image, just so you have an idea who I am. We're a student team of around uh, 10 to 15 active members, depending on uh, time of year and yeah, new people coming into the team all the time. So yeah, it's rotating relatively quickly. Um, and of course, the important part of the team are robots. Uh, we have five robots at the moment. Um, they have a little less degrees of freedom than the robots you saw before. These only have 20 degrees of freedom, which more or less is the standard in our league. Unfortunately, um, I would love to have a bit more 
uh, freedom of movement in some areas, especially in the arms, uh, were quite limited, um, which makes uh, standing up and stuff like that a bit difficult. Um, but yeah, that's our robots. That's what they look like. And uh, yeah, I'm probably going to talk a bit more about the software side of things uh, because there's not that much interesting hardware stuff going on there. So we are using ROS, uh, as was teased before. We're currently, um, or we're almost done migrating from ROS1 to ROS2. Uh, we have run into quite a bunch of issues there. Um, we have a very informative blog post on our website about all the things that went wrong when migrating. Uh, I think I can speak for the team when I say we're still not quite convinced uh, with some choices ROS2 has made. Um, but we were very, very happy with ROS1, but I mean, it's time to make some progress and I guess we influence the way uh, ROS2 is going to be in the future. So yeah, might as well start migrating now. Um, we, as you can see on the right, have quite a bunch of ROS nodes, uh, very small components um, that are each designed with the goal to be as general as possible so that the stuff we are actually developing can be used by all the other teams as well. Um, therefore, all our code is also open source and uh, freely available on GitHub, as well as all our hardware uh, designs as well. Um, mostly based on Python code, uh, a little C++ for the low level stuff uh, and for the things that need to run a bit faster. Um, the, we're basically good at two things. One of them is vision, the other one is motion. Um, the other things are like behavior stuff. We're not quite as good, we're still working on that, but we're really good at those two things. Uh, and we're also doing quite a bunch of research in that area. Um, as for more motion, um, our main motions or the stuff we need all the time as walking, standing up and kicking um, are built in a Cartesian space. We're using Quintix splines for that. So uh, basically modeling the motion with splines and then having uh, yeah, an IK solver uh, oh, through a bunch of PID stabilization, uh, generating a stable and fast motion. Uh, you can see that here at the bottom for standing up. Um, before we made this transition, we used keyframe animation as uh, all the other teams in our league are doing actually as well. And that is an absolute pain to do because uh, it's slow, it's unstable, and if you're moving to another area, which we're doing all the time, when uh, going from one competition to the next, uh, the motion you've made before doesn't work anymore, and you have one student uh, sitting at the edge of the field for five or six hours trying to make a new stand-up motion. So uh, with this system that we've designed, we've uh, managed to significantly improve the timing uh, before we needed around eight or nine seconds to stand up. Now we're somewhere at 2.5 seconds um, and it works significantly more often. So that's uh, just all in all a very good idea. Um, the system we've designed here um, has, I think, 40-ish parameters that can be tuned. Um, and all of these parameters are very clear in what they do with parameters, for example, uh, that describe how far the leg, uh, arms go back or something like that. And these are very intuitively uh, can be tuned. And the best thing about it is we don't even need to tune them ourselves because uh, we employed uh, tree structure Python estimators, um, which basically find a good parameter set uh, in simulation by itself in a couple hours without anyone sitting nearby. And we do that not only for standing up, we do the same thing for walking. Uh, we recently published a paper uh, which slows all our, uh, slows our walking engine on all the robots that actually exist in our league. And it works for all of them and it works uh, relatively quickly. Um, and we also do the same thing for kicking. And for kicking, um, we not only are able to kick straight, like most teams are, when you're using a keyframe animation, you only get one direction, but we are also able to kick in all directions, uh, in theory, even backwards, even though that's not that useful for uh, soccer. Um, our motion, of course, um, 
are quite a bunch of separate nodes that all are running at the same time and all doing their stuff at the same time. So we need some component to control who gets to actually execute the motion, uh, which is our hardware control manager, oh, uh, cumulative control module, um, which basically just yeah, handles the high level stuff of who gets to execute this motion and who doesn't. And that in turn communicates with our ROS control, which does the hardware extraction for the uh, dynamics motors we're using. Um, moving on to vision, um, something we're also pretty uh, experienced with by now. Um, recently, we, uh, our members of our team developed the you only encode once uh, architecture, which uh, is kind of a descendant of the YOLO architecture, um, with the difference that um, since we're having uh, both segmentation and uh, object detection in here, uh, we would need uh, two encoders, but we're only using a single encoder, which encodes everything, and then using both a YOLO decoder for the object detection and a unit decoder for segmentation. And uh, so by doing this, we basically have one end-to-end -end approach, which takes an image and classifies all the objects we need to have uh, from robots, goalposts, um, balls, as well as uh, field borders and field lines. Um, we of course, needed some data to train this. So we just created our own data set uh, containing uh, somewhere around 50,000 images, I think. Um, a very big data set, also publicly available uh, for anyone who wants to start training their own networks on soccer objects. Um, and we, at parts, uh, achieved really incredible results where uh, we as humans were not really able to see the object we're trying to detect anymore. Uh, and we're also very much capable to deal with natural light. Then, of course, we need some self-localization. Uh, for that, we basically just use inverse perspective mapping uh, and then a particle filter um, to basically find the lines in the field and from there try to figure out where we are. Uh, relatively standard approach. And finally, of course, we have some behavior going on. For that, also, we developed our own idea on how to do this uh, the best. Uh, we built our, uh, the so-called dynamic stack decider, um, which is kind of a hybrid between uh, hier hierarchical state machines and behavior trees. Um, so basically, what this means is we have a stack. And uh, we basically have either decisions or actions, or subtrees if you want them, which then in turn lead to either decision or action. Um, and we start uh, going through the script we've written on the right and putting uh, everything we find on a stack and evaluating it and then basically choosing the next one depending on the evaluation. And we have the idea that we can start to re-evaluate something. So in every step, we go uh, through our stack from bottom to top and look at everything and choose uh, first whether it needs to be re-evaluated and if it needs to be re-evaluated uh, we do so and see if it has changed uh, depending to the previous state and if it does everything above this in the stack is being removed and we start from there again uh, if it's still the same we just go further to the top until we reach an action and then we look at whether this action uh, or then we execute this action and the action can either be uh, popped from the stack then it's gone and we go back to the next element below, or we keep it on the stack and then execute it as long as no deci uh, decision below it changes. Yeah, and as you can see on the right, we uh, build our own domain specific language to have an easy way to build these uh, uh, stacks. And yeah, we're doing pretty well with this. Um, yeah, it works just fine. The most important part of behavior, obviously, is uh, our cheering animation. Um, I think that's the thing we are most famous for in RoboCup at the moment, because we're not playing too well right now, but boy, can we cheer. And that's something, I guess. Um, if I could move on, there we go. Yeah. Um, like I said, um, all of our stuff is uh, publicly available on uh, GitHub, all our code. Uh, you can have a look at it there, or you visit either our documentation if you have questions, or our general website where all of our publications are listed. 
or if you have any questions um, about anything I've shown you, I don't think we have much time for questions right now, but if you have anything that interests you, uh, just send us an email at info at bitbots.de and yeah, we'll try to get in touch as soon as possible and yeah, we're very happy to help you if you want to use some of our software. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we've only got a few minutes. Uh, there aren't currently any questions in the chat, but for me, it's great to see the the way that because RoboCup and and you know the field of humanoid robotics has so much uh, going on, teams can be entirely devoted to a new mechanical design versus uh, moving to a new you know version of software, um, and still be getting you know different kinds of results out of it. Yeah, definitely. And and and. Uh, I can understand the case for saying you wouldn't want to use ROS. I can certainly say, you know, I would probably end up choosing to use ROS because, um, you know, even with the abstraction, uh, I do not feel confident in writing code to the quality that would be required uh, and in the quantity that is required for a humanoid robot. I would want to go with uh, better software written by people who are better at it than me. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think that's also the reason why we choose to stick with ROS because in our opinion, I can see the appeal of building everything on their own, of course. Uh, but yeah, in our opinion, it just makes sense to use the solutions that are already there and build something new on top of it. And, and you know, I, I uh, when you compare, I, I often try to think of um, RoboCup, and I think you can compare it to things like Formula One in that teams will often make investments that don't pay off for a few years. Uh, yeah, true. When they do, they then pay off for many years and you can't stop them until you've made the effort to catch up on that investment. Um, yeah. And that can be, you know, getting moving to ROS2 uh, early in this decade might be something that really pays dividends as we get towards the end of the decade um, for the humanoid robots in this uh, category. Um, yeah, I hope so. I will tell. Um, right. Uh, and I think that just about takes us over to our, our next couple of presentations. But Michael, I think I'm going to let the... Uh, let you take over now for the time being, if that's okay. Yeah, you got it. I'll take over hosting. Um, thanks, Ollie. Uh, and thank you to the uh, BitBots team. That was a wonderful presentation. It's really great to see, you know, kind of two different teams uh, in the space and kind of see the two different approaches to, you know, the control and programming these things. So thank you again. Next up, we have uh, Humanoid Mode, which I believe we heard from you all last year. And this could be somewhat of a uh, update. Um, do we have anyone from humanoid mode in? Human mode. Yeah, I'm in. Yes. Sorry, sorry, human mode. There we go. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, uh, you're ready to go. Go ahead yeah. and take us away. OK, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is William Kerber. I'm the CEO of Human Mode Robotics. Uh, my wife, G, and I started this company in 2017 because we're both futurists and we just love technology. And we were excited about the challenge of building intelligent multi-use robots. So that's been the focus of our robotics program. Um, we're located in Oklahoma City. We recently built a new shop here to support better fabrication equipment. Uh, but like for many of you out there, there's not a lot of robotics companies around here or like sprawling university programs. So we're pretty much on our own and building this stuff. Uh, but we've made good progress, and it's really awesome to have an internet community. So I want to thank uh, the Reddit Robotics Group for inviting us back this year and letting us uh, talk about what we've been up to. So I got a presentation here. Let me just go ahead and start it. <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, share screen. I think two. All right. All right, we can see it. Make sure this... Okay, there you go. <clears throat> All right, cool. Um, so like I mentioned, um, you know, our task at Human Mode is just working each year to make incremental improvements on the physical bots and also on our synthetic intelligence. Um, right, uh, we build a lot of prototypes. Uh, it's very iterative. We just move on to the next after the last. And each one is meant to challenge us and teach us something new. We don't really put a lot of uh, focus on aesthetics on these robots, really. It's just about uh, problem solving and uh, forcing ourselves to improve. So 
in the past, uh, we started our robotics program with these robots on the left. Uh, they were really interesting because they were all controlled through VR. So we called them the Gemini because uh, they mimicked your movement whenever you controlled them through VR. Uh, and VR is actually a really big part of our company. In fact, the other team at Human Mode has been working on immersive VR metaverse called Massive Loop since about 2018. So this theme of like extending your presence into a physical or digital avatar runs really deep at our company. And uh, we'll likely continue to improve it in our robots. Uh, but more recently, uh, in the past 18 months, we tried to focus on two specific areas. One was improving our ability to do simulation so that we can iterate our design and software instead of just through hardware, uh, trying to approach a one-to-one -one match between our physical and the simulated environment, and then also early work on legged robots. <clears throat> so to accomplish this, uh, we built a few versions of a quadruped that we called the Lynx. Uh, there are three versions of the Lynx. One, it was electrically actuated. Uh, the second was hydraulically actuated. And then the third is the Lynx AI, it, which is a mini bot that we use for AI training. And this robot actually taught itself to walk in simulation, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our team, uh, our uh, team lead, Jonathan uh, Gilmore, Mehul Kumar and AI. Baudo and Mechanical and Jay Choi and Software, uh, so they can describe these projects in more detail, starting with uh, Bao and Mechanical. Thank you, William. Um, so I'm the Mechanical Engineer. I oversee the design and prototyping process. Uh, I want to start off by giving an overview of our design process. Uh, so the cornerstone of this project focused on making a robust and lightweight quadruped system. The goal was to have the weight distribution focus on the upper body of the robot, creating a low inertia leg for the quadruped. Hence, the actuator being a sample at the shoulder for all three joint movement on the leg. Uh, we also use CAD and simulation program uh, in our process as well. Regarding the CAD is used to find ideal arrangement for the component, essential criteria like the material property, the moment of inertia and the center of mass all play an important role in the uh, assembly of the quadruped. And then simulation was also done on the articulated model as well for this, to, see, to prove that the movement is successful. Uh, when it comes to producing the part, we went with 3D printing and CNC uh, for custom component. And then we also used some 80-20 extrusion components uh, for the ease of assemblability, which was uh, essential when it comes to buying uh, office self components. Uh, when it comes to actuation selection, uh, we wanted an actuator that have uh, the ability to back drive and have compli compliance for it as well. Uh, I want to pass it on to our software engineer now, uh, Jonathan Gilmore. Mic check. Okay, hi, I'm uh, Jonathan. I do the uh, electrical and uh, uh, low-level software. Uh, so the first, uh, this is the first uh, links we built. This is the uh, electrically actuated uh, links that uses the uh, MIT uh, Cheetah motors. And we built this primarily as a platform just to learn about what it takes to walk on four legs. Um, we built it to uh, just experiment with different algorithms and uh, basic game pat patterns. Uh, the next uh, robot that we built was the uh, hydraulic links, and that had pretty much the same goals as the first one. Uh, we built it to uh, just experiment with, just as a platform to experiment with. Uh, we also wanted to try porting over all the everything that we learned from the first robot onto this uh, second one, this totally different platform, and see how much of it carries over. And and uh, we also wanted to experiment with uh, hydraulic systems. The third robot, now this is just a really small, lightweight robot, but we wanted it to be really easy to fix and repair. So it, it doesn't have anything special on it hardware-wise. It's mostly just, uh, you know, your standard off-the-shelf uh, hobbyist servos. But we wanted this one to be able to be uh, repaired easily because as 
uh, opposed to the first two, which are uh, running on these manually coded algorithms with you know inverse kinematics and all that, and these pre-programmed uh, uh, gate patterns. This third one is running entirely off of AI. There's no no inverse kinematics, no hard coded uh, gate patterns or anything like that. It's just pure AI controlling the servo angles. So you know, it's AI. Uh, it does some unexpected things sometimes. So we didn't want it to just you know freak out and break. Um, and if it did, then we could fix it easily. So I'm going to turn it over to Mayhul, and he's going to get into uh, more in depth about that. Hey, uh, so yeah, so I'm Mehul. I uh, work with AI at Human Mode. Uh, so in the past, if you've seen our presentations, uh, you know, we've used AI before, but it was mainly as a tool to like help with navigation and like, you know, do some object detection, collision avoidance. But uh, now our goal was to build like a fully autonomous system, right? That can learn to walk on its own, like no user input, you know, uh, it's able to, you know, solve hard problems, uh, you know, do navigation, go over obstacles and, uh, you know, and uh, and also be like modular so that, you know, we can take the same, you know, system that we have built and use it in, in the future to train like, you know, different robots. And it's not just for like, you know, locomotion. We can also train it to do like, you know, complex challenges in simulation. So the the first step was to was to build or find like a game engine or simulation platform that can, uh, you know, closely replicate real life and like be as close as possible, like one is to one, right? So uh, one of the challenges in doing that was to like match the friction, right? Between the floor and the, and the feet of the robot. And uh, there are a lot of like stuff involved in that with like restitution and dynamic static friction. And um, some of the other challenges were like, the center of mass of different like you know parts when you just like bring in a 3d model is different from like you know a cre a re creating like an actual robot and the center of mass of those parts might not be the same and uh, another problem was with like you know game engines and other simulation platforms uh, things kind of seem like you know blown up like they are not they're not like one is to one scale like in uh, things are like kind of extra in those like simulation platforms, they are like built to like, you know, have huge explosions, like do massive flips. So they don't really match the real world one is to one. So our goal was to like explore different platforms and find like the best one that we can use to do some simulation and to build like a virtual gym, right? With different obstacles, uh, navigation and uh, different challenges so that we can train our robots in there and see what they can do. Um, so you see the links mini walking that was the so that was the end result of our experiments so we have uh, we've, we've trained a reinforcement learning model uh, to like you know uh, learn to walk from scratch and get over obstacles and navigate and turn based on like you know what it needs to do and uh, yeah this is uh, this you know this will really help us in the future as well when we when we have more complex robots that cannot you know you can't really expect to write like 900 lines of code per action right so now i'm going to revert back to william to talk about our advancements in vr control um yeah okay um so we've, uh, you know, we continue to work on uh, improvements in VR control. Uh, their early version started with what we called the mech suit, which was sort of like a VR, um, uh, I guess a mocap suit primarily, but also uh, with the goal of, of really controlling physical avatars. Um, one of the issues that, they, that we had back then was depth perception uh, because the vision was basically mapped to a flat plane so uh, we really couldn't utilize it for, you know, grabbing things remotely. Um, but uh, we've continued to update that. And you can see in, in kind of this experiment, uh, you know, we, we have a pretty good uh, ability to grab and manipulate uh, items remotely about, while viewing them through VR. So uh, Jay would normally be talking about that. This, uh, he, he's not available right now, but 
Um, but uh, we, yeah, we continue to ad advance that side of it uh, in, in all these features. Uh, so we have, you know, uh, trained walking, um, you know, um, VR control uh, remotely, uh, and then also uh, just general uh, walking and gait. They'll all make it their way into our next uh, prototype, which we'll start working on uh, here at the um, uh, early August. Uh, so we're excited about that. And that's pretty much uh, what, we, what we've what we been up to. So uh, I don't know if there's any uh, questions. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much. I mean, you guys have come a really long way, even from you know the presentation you showed us last year. So this has been really fantastic to see your progress here. Um, just, uh, yeah, I had a question. My, oh, never mind. We have some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, are there a lot of robotics enthusiasts in Oklahoma City? Well, we're here. <laughs> we're, we're, we're enthusiastic. We're enthusiastic enough for everyone. So <laughs> I think we'll, I think we'll build, we'll, we'll uh, help spark that. So that's, that's our goal. Good. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then another question is, uh, are you guys working with NVIDIA Isaac at all for your uh, simulation environments? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we can talk more about that, but definitely, uh, I mean, we we use them all. I mean, we use Unity because we, we have a lot of familiarity with that. We use Isaac, yeah, so yeah. we use, um, I mean, we, he, he keep, but we basically spent the last 18 months like exhausting uh, research in them. Uh, Mayhul can talk more about it. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, I think Isaac Sim worked the best for us, but like William said, we have tried pretty much everything else that's out there. But uh, I think Isaac Sim is pretty good. Um, it has some issues in Windows, but in Linux, it works pretty well. Okay, great. Um, and, and then I had a question, which is, um, have any of your robots seen any kind of real world applications in terms of like, are you contracting with any companies that are you know, using your robots for inspection or anything? Or, you know, no, not yet. No. Uh, yeah. We're just still, you know, working on kind of building a base of capability so that we can focus it on, you know, specific, um, you know, I guess, end goal. Uh, I don't really like to, to approach that too soon because I think there's plenty to research and anything we'd build would be less capable than after we've, we've kind of forced ourselves to go through these. Uh, exercises. So mostly it's just incremental uh, design and building right now. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for such a great yeah. presentation. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. And uh, great job coordinating between five presenters. That's the first <laughs> time we've seen that. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Sanjeev with the Juggernaut robot. So Sanjeev, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, let me share my screen first. All right. Uh, am I audible? Yep, you're good. Uh, I'm audible, right? Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, so, hi, I am Sanjeev. I am a senior software engineer at Quitub. So, so, I'm into software mostly, but uh, uh, robotics uh, as, as a hobby, I do. Uh, it generally like uh, um, since I'm more interested in, in it. So I started since last two years. I uh, have been building robots, small robots um, mostly. And uh, so this presentation would be about a robot that I'm building currently. So it's called Juggernaut. Um, why I built it? Because uh, the key objective of mine is to basically take this robot and finally it should look like uh, my favorite uh, character here so which is uh, a character from dota 2 so as, as you can see here this was my first robot the first version one so this is the second version uh, which it, it looks like this now you can see that in the background uh, probably um, and uh, my goals are very simple uh, not um, this, uh, like it is not like uh, automatic nav navigation and all. Um, currently, my my primary objectives are uh, the robot should basically walk on plane surfaces without any external forces and no back drivability. Um, but um, ultimately, um, I am going to achieve that step by step. Uh, but for for now, my goals are very uh, very simple. Um, and uh, yeah, let me go to the next slide. So uh, this is the, this is the robot's current state as of now. It has um, six degree of freedom per leg, 
um, and I did um, uh, the designs in such a way that uh, I can use low cost actuators. Like as you can see here, these are uh, um, basically stepper motors. And some of these designs I uh, got inspired from by just by seeing at 3D printers, like how they move and all. Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, he passed uh, three degree of freedom. Um, basically, uh, uh, the hip joint can move um, in horizontal as, in all three directions as well. Um, similarly, the knee uh, knee joint has one degree of freedom. It is controlled by a stepper here, and uh, a feet has two degree of freedom, and that's basically controlled by two uh, DC motors. Uh, I will show you the video at the end. Probably uh, that would be more um, uh, to you to look. And in order to control all this, uh, in, uh, I'm using TMC, uh, 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 TMC for stepper, uh, and I'm using TC for controlling all the. Uh, uh, so let me let me go ahead. Uh, that would be much better, I guess. So this this is how I have built uh, um, uh, some of the parts. As you can see, um, the motors are the motors which controls. Uh, the feet are way up above, uh, which are placed here. Um, and similarly, the motors that control the hips are placed over here. And they are controlled uh, via lead screws with uh, a lever kind of design. Uh, so this, this I got inspired from Robotex as well as uh, the Atlas, which you might already know, uh, the humanoid robot. Um, so some of the inspirations I got from them uh, and I designed this uh, in such a way that um, I can use steppers or uh, in any actuators which are available uh, to me. And uh, this is uh, the general flow, what I have in the electronics on the electronic side. Um, I have not done fully till now, like I have Jetson Nano, but I have not programmed it yet um, right now. I have what I have built is basic movements of the robot itself, but not uh, the general walking algorithm and all that I still have to do. Uh, but this is the general flow. Like uh, basically, uh, uh, my end goal is to control the robot through some API, and uh, that will basically uh, get uh, signals, uh, send signals to TNC, which is on the, um, which will basically sends uh, absolute positions of each and every joint. Uh, so let's say if it's hip joint, it has uh, three degree of freedom. So I, I'm recording three different uh, angles, um, similarly for other joints as well. And this TNC controls stepper motors, send signal to Arduino, which basically sends uh, signal to control all the steppers. Similarly, there is a DC motor here, a, a, a uh, gear DC motor uh, with an encoder. Uh, these are basically used for controlling the feet and they are controlled by Arduino Nano. Um, so they are not in the same because uh, I um, because of uh, because I could easily control steppers and DC motor separately. Um, yeah, um, that's it regarding the my short presentation. I will show you a small video of what I have built. Uh, so uh, these are a AS5600 uh, absolute encoders, and there is this stepper motor here. Um, and these two are the DC motors. And uh, right now, uh, in this video, I'm not a lot of movements are there because I just bas uh, basically fried some of the boards. Uh, so uh, one of the knees is not working. <laughs> So since they are steppers with TMC drivers, they basically make zero noise. Um, obviously, the DC geared motors make more uh, little bit of noise as well. But in this video, you cannot see that. Uh, 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 while while I was recording this video, uh, that was not working.
yeah uh, that's it regarding my presentation any questions very cool yeah i i do have a question you know i, I think a lot of these um these projects we see use um you know bldc motors or or brushed motors just so you can have the direct torque input you know what made you decide to kind of go with a, a stepper motor approach rather than those uh the thing is like i initially started with uh, uh initially started with uh, servos hobby servos and i then I, I got to know that they are basically not that good uh, at controlling exact positions um, um uh, and so I had option of these uh, brushless motors uh, or, and as well as stepper motors, but stepper motors are way a lot cheaper than uh, brushless motors as well as uh, the drivers that come along with it. And also if um, brushless load motors along with drivers also, um, uh, some of these components are not available here directly. So, uh, and since I started just two years back uh, learning my on my own, um, I did not want to invest uh, without having full knowledge. So that's the first first approach. Uh, so I started with uh, servos and then moved to steppers. Um, I did use the uh, DC motors here, gear DC motor, uh, but not brushless motors. Um, and uh, in order, I, and I did have I did think through a lot. Like in, if I had direct drive with stepper motors, uh, that that would have not been possible at all. Like you cannot directly put steppers at a joint and it will not take the load. So I did, that's the reason I took this approach of using um, lead screws. Uh, although this is not back drivable and all, um, but I did I wanted to gain more experience. So that's the reason I took this approach. Okay, great. Yeah. Really interesting. Sorry, sorry, Michael, just I uh, once you've been really, really interesting and um, this is a co both commenting on yours and answering one of the questions asked in the comments. Um, it's an interesting choice to use stepper motors and linear screws because, yes, it's then non-back drivable. So, you know, um, with, a, with a robot, certainly for all the reasons you're building, of learning and control, that makes perfect sense to do it rather than spending, what, three times the amount of money just to make something that then uh, has the ability to kick you in the face and hurt you rather than moving slowly. And the other thing is, when you look at the other humanoids we've seen in this category, they're not moving that fast. So, you know, a stepper motor, if you are, if you have the motor and the gear train well optimized, you don't have to necessarily rule it out as being able to walk, though it might not be able to run anytime soon, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you have plans to get that then to a fully walking? Uh, yeah, I do. I do have uh, plans to get this robot itself on walking, but uh, obviously it cannot run. Uh, right now, I'm running at almost um, almost half the speed. Uh, it can go more, uh, but obviously it cannot run and do a lot of dynamic movements. Uh, it will be just like uh, walking inside the house. Uh, th that much only can I can achieve with this design. Um, um, so right now, like. Um, apart from my job, I do this uh, as a hobby. Like um, so, that's the reason I chose this approach. Learn slowly, and then I can start investing when I have. Because even even with this, I fried so many <laughs> TMC drivers. Um, so if I had used brushless, probably I don't know. Like <laughs> I would have fried more. <laughs> you have to, yeah, you would. You would. Um, uh, it would have been more work and more pain and. And you've been very smart in recognizing, well, you know, you're not trying to build the world's best humanoid robot. You're working within limitations and saying, OK, this robot is limited to my house. So does it need yeah. to walk that fast? No, that that's very good. A very smart way of going about it. Um, I'm also yeah. very jealous of your tool rack behind you, the way everything's neat and organized. I don't have that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I just recently built this. Uh, I still have to do a lot, uh, uh, a lot of organization. Yeah. Wonderful. Back to you, Michael. Great. Well, I think we had one more uh, question, but it kind of already got answered, which is about the you know future goals of the project, where you want to go from here. So uh, I think that really takes us to the end of our uh, legged robot, our, our bio-inspired robot section. So 
Uh, Sanjeev, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, thank you to all of our presenters this morning, especially our keynote speaker, Mateo. And uh, we have an hour break for lunch right now. And then after that, we hope to see you this afternoon in the US, this evening in the UK, uh, for our session on human robot interaction with Dr. Ruth Aylett uh, as our keynote speaker. So thank you very much. And we will see you in a few. Thank you. Okay, cool. Fabulous.